The Werewolf's Daughter by H. Warner Munn A band of tired, dusty men, travel-worn but gay, plodded down the road which led to Ponkert as the swift summer night began to drop down on Hungary. In the barracks of the soldiers, who were quartered perhaps a mile from the village, scattered lights were shining, although the western sky was still red. The sentry that paced before the gate spat disgustedly on the ground as the men went by, flinging cheerful jibes at one who was satisfied to risk life itself for hire when he might be his own master, free as the wind that blows through the forest. He, in his turn, sneered at a folk too wild and unnatural to appreciate the comforts of a warm bed indoors, regular meals, and the joy of service to the country. It was the age-old quarrel of plainsman versus townsman, wanderer against stolid peasant, one the solid backbone of the nation, the other its restless blood ever on the move. There were many such roving bands in this period of unrest. Times were ripe for change, and one was coming even then, for on the watery desert of the Atlantic, three small ships ploughed an uncharted sea, ships manned by the scum of the waterfronts of Palos and emptied prisons, but which were a line flung from the old world to the new, along which would flow news that would affect the destiny of countless yet unborn. But now, Ponkert drowsed away among its surrounding hills, far enough from the Black Sea to be safe, from the Turks with whom the country was sporadically at war, small enough to leave other communities in peace, and because the soil of that section was poor and stony, the people having little of value, they were not disturbed in their routine of life. The resting of food from the barren fields, squabbling in barter at the village shops, strolls at twilight by the riverside, devotion at church, In such manner flowed the even current of their lives, pleasantly interrupted by an occasional caravan that passed through, such as now was on the border of the village. These wanderers were always welcome, for they brought news, a thing hardly come by, a breath of life to the stagnating community. They were horse traders, travelling merchants, musicians of note, and their women were possessed of strange, magical powers. By these powers they could divine from the stars a pool of ink, or the lines in a man's palm, what the future had in store for that man. And, most mysterious of all, anyone might enjoy these marvellous attainments for the price of a silver piece. Their advent was born before them on the wind, which carried the squeal of ungreased cartwheels, the drone of foreign voices, the clank of horses' hoofs on stone, and the excited yappings of the dogs which followed the caravan. They were partly wolf, and the town dogs met them with bared fangs. A dozen fights would follow before they won through Ponkert, and the first wagon rolled into camp. The wagons creaked and groaned into Ponkert, lurching wildly over the cobbled streets, the doughty little Tartar ponies straining every muscle on the unfamiliar footing. By the side of the wagons strode bronzed, bearded men of many races, but known by the general term of gypsies. Great, strapping fellows, hardly one over thirty, all showing mouthfuls of teeth in broad grins as they called to acquaintances among the townspeople bandying coarse jests back and forth. This was a band that had often passed through Ponkert, following a regular orbit of trade that swung through Germany, France, Italy, and on into the colder countries, completing its circle at the starting point in about two years. In all of these countries, the band had acquired new recruits, adventurers all, that longed for excitement and variety or were called by the more prosaic lure of trade, so that the faces of stolid, fair-haired Teutons 
were to be seen beside the dark countenances of the Latin races. Mirko, the gypsy chieftain and a pole, riding along at the head of the caravan, dog-weary but cockily twisting his long black mustachios in order to create a terrifying aspect which would awe the natives, was suddenly aware of a drumming of hoofs in his rear. Out of the tail of his eye, he saw the nose and head of a magnificent bay creep up to his side, nostrils flaring as the animal changed its gait from a trot to a walk. Well aware of the newcomer's identity, he gave no sign that he had noticed the coming, only twisting his appendages the more. These mustachios were the pride of Mirko's heart, and his greatest joy for, hanging as they did like the tusks of a walrus, each full four inches long, they transformed his naturally benevolent face into an ugly mask. Mirko was a gentle soul, but there were few, even in his band, that realized it, because of his bluster, his wit, and his tremendous scowl. These had made him chief, the fiercest ruled in that desperate crew. So again he preened his moustache and scowled his ugliest, looking straight ahead between his horse's ears. A gentle, persuasive voice spoke to him. How long in this village, Mirko? The chief grunted and turned around. You, eh, I thought so. No one else would be adulpate enough to run his horse to death after it had travelled fifty miles since morning. The boy grinned and wagged his finger reprovingly at his leader. Ah, Mirko, what language to use to a poor fellow who came to visit because he thought you looked lonesome. Audacious speech to one as powerful as a gypsy chief, but Mirko loved the lad for it, and his mock scowl vanished in spite of himself. Never been able to fool you, have I? he said cautiously, looking back to see if any of the following troops were in earshot. These two were friends. When Mirko had first met Gunnar, the young Frenchman was wandering alone in Russia in search of adventure. His only weapon had been a bandura, or three-stringed violin, with which he sang like any troubadour for his supper, and a short dagger with which he carved that supper and his enemies alike. Mirko's heart warmed to the young daredevil so far from home, and he invited him to become a member of the band. The wanderer accepted with alacrity, being ever on the lookout for new experiences. Since that time, they had covered many a weary mile together, and Mirko loved the boy like a son. Hugo Gunnar set his cap askew with a slap of his hand, giving his embryonic moustache a fillip, and, ready for fight or frolic in the new encampment, he repeated his question. How long? said the chief. Three days, perhaps. Not more. Less, I hope. We must be in Nizhny Novgorod for the great fair, and already we are far behind our plans. There's a sight for you, boy, when we get you back in Russia. Thousands of people, tents, Shows, monsters wrestling, bear baiting, tame wolves, freaks, horse races. You'll never forget it. And the girls, ah, Hugo, the girls. Every pretty girl in Russia goes to Nizhny Novgorod at fair time. Mirko smacked his lips. We'll have to buy some new clothes for you. Nothing like gay feathers at mating time. Bah, broke in Gunnar. You know I'm not interested in girls. Chatter, chatter like rooks all day long, and when they have finished, nothing has been said. Not interested? Hugo, are you ill? The chief asked solicitously, but with a crinkle about his thin mouth. Why, boy, you are not human. Now, when I was your age, I... But here came a clattering interruption of hoofs, and Mirko bit his words short. His face resumed its usual saturnine scowl, and he snarled viciously at the intruder. Only a trifling matter of a lost colt, but Mirko flew into a towering rage and had to go back personally to see that the search for it was undertaken at once. 
and Hugo Gunnar was left alone at the head of the caravan. Although they had passed through the town, he was very appreciative of the honour and sat straight in the saddle, now and then glancing left and right, filled with a hope that people would believe him chief. They had left Ponkert a mile behind, with a forest to their left and a few scattered cottages dotted among cultivated fields upon their right. The campground was not far when Gana, allowing his glance to rove carelessly over the nearest of the buildings to see if anyone was watching, saw upon a rude porch a girl standing there. She was looking at him intently, and their glances met and clung. With that meeting, soul spoke to soul, and each, in a second's time, felt a sudden surge of emotion. The riders behind reached the youth and passed him, some grinning, others frowning, but all with crossed fingers as they neared the cottage. When they rode before him, shutting off his view of the lovely girl, cheeks now beginning to crimson at his steady gaze, he scowled, making aimless gestures with one hand, as a man does to drive away an annoying fly which buzzes by his face as he reads. A warm, strange glow of happiness filled his being as he looked. Her hair was chestnut brown and curled just enough to form a natural wave that his fingers yearned to stroke. Her eyes were dark, but colour in them he could not distinguish, for her long lashes hid them. Her nose had that slight tilt which makes even an ordinary face adorable, but hers was no ordinary face. At a later time, he saw there were a very few small freckles, lightly sprinkled here and there, like sun-kissed flower dust. But the mouth did not agree with the rest of her perfect features. The corners drooped and cast a sad, forlorn look over the sweet face. It was a mouth that had smiled very little in her life, and suddenly it came to him that it would be worth anything he possessed if he could make that face light up with pleasure and hear her laugh. So lovely she looked, yet so sad and sorrowful, so cuddlesome for someone's strong arms, yet so obviously unwanted by anyone. For one who is loved does not have that dejected air. But now her eyes were shining, her lips half parted as they gazed at one another, oblivious of their surroundings, not noticing that there was any other person on earth except themselves, though men were shouting and urging their beasts, wagons creaking dismally and the dust of the road rolling high between them. Gunnar felt a blow upon his shoulder and a dig in the ribs. A jovial voice bellowed in his ear, Aha, Hugo, caught at last. Not interested in girls, eh? When they fall, they fall hard. But who is the fair one? And Mirko squinted through the clouds of dust. Then his face paled beneath the grime. White Christ, he croaked and crossed himself with unaccustomed fingers, his banter slipping from him like a cloak. The witch! Come away, quickly, she will put a spell on you, boy. And he struck Hugo's horse a blow on the haunch that set him moving. Hugo had been conscious that the horse had stopped, yet fully two-thirds of the caravan had passed while he sat staring at the sad girl. And now, while he and Mirko galloped to their former place, he turned in his saddle for one last look but the door of the cottage was shut and she was gone. Riding once more at the head of the caravan, Mirko explained the terror that hung over her and why she was feared by all in Ponkert. The caravan swung to the left about the forest before he finished and, to a question, he replied, Her foster father is an old and grizzled giant, a marvel with the broadsword. That is all that has saved her from the peasants of this accursed village. They fear him, so they hardly dare to look at her. But when he dies, her life will not be worth that.
He snapped his fingers, and the horse he rode took on a swifter gait, just as they entered a green clearing in the forest. Park-like it was, and spacious, and in its centre bubbled up a clear spring of sweet water. By the time the two horses had drunk in the pool, the first wagon was rolling into the camp, and the band was at home again for the night, one of many homes, and for many the only home they knew. Chapter 2 To the girl upon the porch, as she stood watching the tired caravan plod down the road, a voice from inside the cottage had spoken. She turned and closed the door, walking with the easy swing of a young panther to the chair where the old man sat and waited for her. There was about him a certain dignity that hangs about one who is used to commanding and being instantly obeyed. In person he was huge, with large, hairy hands and tremendously muscled arms, depending from broad, strong shoulders. His waist tapered and was lean, and above was a great depth of lung. His head was large and crowned with a mass of iron-gray hair. His leonine face was gaunt and bony, with the lines of patient suffering about his mouth. Now the deep-set eyes glowed with pleasure as the girl came toward him, and a greeting rumbled from his cavernous chest. More gypsies, Ivga, he asked. Yes, father, she answered, a fond note in her voice as she smiled at him with a look of adoration. Many of them this time. The old man sighed. Bound for the fair, I suppose. Well, some day you and I will go, dear, when my legs are well. He smoothed the blanket that swathed his knees. For a year he had not taken a step. A paralysis of the limbs rendered him helpless. There were grave doubts that he would ever walk again, but the girl had never been allowed to suspect that the ailment was other than temporary, and she looked forward to the time when they should stroll again by the river and through the forests. She placed another stick upon the irons in the fireplace, and a row of crackling began as the flames seized it. While she stared into the fire, the crippled giant spoke again. Bring me my sword, Ivga, if you will. From its pegs above the fireplace, she lifted down the massive weapon, peeled back the soft leather casing that covered it, and laid it across his knees. It was a beautiful sword, a double-edged instrument of death, as sharp as Roland's sword, Durandal, and on its five feet of blue steel was one word of gold inlay, gate opener. It had opened, in fact, many gates, both material and spiritual, being a crusader's sword that had hammered before the portal of Acre, swung again in the taking of the holy city and in other battles, proving itself a gate opener indeed, between this world and the next. In Dimitri, the sword of unknown history and age, had found one who could wield it as it deserved, for although many owners had gripped it in battle since those roaring days, and the ribbed black hilt was now smooth, it was too ponderous to be used as other than a two-handed sword for most men. And the days of such swords was nearly over. Dimitri, with his strong right arm, had brandished it like an ordinary sabre, smashing by brute force through those that opposed him. In crossing the room, Ivga, strong as she was, staggered beneath the weight of it. When Dimitri moved his arms in the polishing, the cloth that covered them bulged with the play of his muscles. Often, in fun, before his legs failed him, he would stand upright thrust out his sword arm and dare her to bring it down if she could, and though she hung from it by her hands with her full weight, feet drawn up and not touching the floor, it would be minutes before the arm came down. Such was the giant's strength. His pleasures during his year of illness were few. The sight of Ivgar, ever busied with his comfort, rude wood carving to kill the time which hung so heavily upon him, 
the rare visits of some of the soldiers that he had commanded in years before, and the last but greatest joy, the sharpening of his beloved sword. A half dozen times a day he would labour upon its keen edge, sharpening it over and over until, like the fabled sword of Roland, it might almost have severed a pillow of down that floated upon water driven by the wind against its keen edge. Yet as Roland was dissatisfied with the keenness of his sword, recasting it until it would sever three pillows, so Dimitri laboured in perpetual employment upon gate opener's edge, breathing upon some fancied spot of rust on the mirror surface, then dropping the polishing rag to sharpen a roughness that no one else could see, never admitting that there was such a thing as utter perfection. For then his chief delight would be over, and he loved this heavy blade that could cut through bone like cheese. This day he stroked the whetstone along its edge with soft, loving movements, the thin whisper from the razor edge as though gate opener answered its master's low crooning in some metallic language which only they two could understand. To him, labouring at his endless task of love, she came with a query on her lips and with worried, perplexed eyes. She came listlessly across the room, dropping upon her knees beside his chair, and laid a cool hand upon his wrist as he vigorously plied again the polishing rag. Father, she said as he looked up, why do people hate me so? Hate you, child? Dimitri smiled. No one hates you. They do, she insisted. Everyone hates me. When I go down into the village, all of them look at me so strangely that it makes me feel afraid, and I come home as soon as I can. How do they look at you? asked Dimitri, a little vein on each temple commencing to throb, and, unnoticed by either, the whetstone fell to the floor. Slyly, out of the corners of their eyes when I pass, and they edge far away from me if they can. Then, sometimes, after I have gone by, they make this sign and spit upon the ground behind me. Even the gypsies today, here, she closed the second and third fingers of her right hand into the palm and held them down with the thumb, thus making with the index and little fingers the sign of the horns, a charm still used in some countries against the evil eye. What does it mean? Dimitri ignored the question. Do they ever say anything to you? He gritted. No, she hesitatingly replied. Not to me, but I have heard some say which under their breath as I passed. By God, if I had my strength, exclaimed the cripple passionately. His knuckles whitened as his hands clenched on the chair arms. Breathing hard, his whole body trembled. He half rose, but the exertion was too much. His paralyzed limbs refused to bear his weight, and he fell back into the chair, where he rested for a few moments with eyes shut. The girl, alarmed by his silence, was about to speak, when he said in a lifeless tone, how long have they acted so toward you, Ivga? About a year, but they always shunned me, ever since I can remember. But they have been more open since I became sick, more insulting. Yes, father, the girl confessed. So, he muttered, half to himself, when the lion is caged, the dogs grow bold. Well, Ivga, Best stay indoors for a while until my legs get better, and then we'll leave this place. Ponkert, pest hole. He laughed shortly. Keep away from the town. Stay here or near where I can see you. None shall touch you here. I think I can promise you that. His face set into hard, sinister lines that his soldiers of old would have recognized as his fighting face but which frightened the girl who had never seen the terrible look that now he wore. But why do they hate me? She sobbed. I never harmed them or anything belonging to them. I would love them all, everybody if they would only let me. 
Nobody loves me but you. Nobody ever has. No one would play with me when I was little. The games would break up if I tried to join. No one but you has ever taken me for boat rides on the river, or for walks, or picnics in the old forest. Weren't you happy, so, little daughter? Dimitri asked sadly. I tried to make you happy. Yes, I was, then. But now I want to be loved by other people, too. I want to be liked. I want to be loved because I am myself, and not because I am your daughter. I don't want everybody to hate me when I have done nothing to hurt them. Oh, I would love everybody, anybody, so much, if they would treat me kindly just a little bit. But everybody hates me so. I don't know what I want, but I am so lonesome that I feel as though I ought to be dead. I should have known, the cripple groaned in remorse. I was a fool trying to live in this village. I have spoiled your life, Ivga. Can you forgive me? There is nothing to forgive, father. Why should I? She lifted a tear-wet face to him. See, I'm smiling. I didn't mean it, really, I didn't. I don't mind these people. They are nothing to me. But don't make me stay inside, penned in like an animal. I couldn't stand it. I must be free. I should die. You may die if you don't stay in, he groaned. These dogs yelp first, then bite. And I... I am helpless to protect you, Ivka. I am not your father, but I command you, by the love you say you feel for me, to stay close by. Danger is coming to us. Not my... The girl began, in a dazed tone, but Dmitri interrupted with a quick gesture. Wait, he said. I will tell you everything. I should have done so long ago, but I could not bear to do it. They hate you. And now I believe it must be a hate because they fear you. Fear me? The girl laughed. I only wish they did. If I were big and strong like you, father, I might make them fear me. But why should they be afraid of a little girl like me? And why hate me? They hate you because they fear you, the cripple repeated. All men hate the thing they fear because they are ashamed of fear and deny that they are afraid even to themselves. Still, they do fear, and sometimes they remove the cause of that fear. If it is an animal, they cage or tame it. If it is a poisonous weed or fruit or snake, they avoid or destroy it. If it is a man, they slay him. And they, all of them in this village of Ponkert, are afraid of you. As she was about to interrupt, he stopped her. Don't, Ivka. I will tell you a story that I should have told you long ago, and think not too hardly of me, because you never knew before. You see, I thought you were happy, and I love you so I could not bear to hurt you. I love you with all a father's love, but I am not your father. I am a Czech, hired by good King Matthias, the first really brave king Hungary has ever had. Many of us came here to fight for him, and as we were dressed in black armor, we called ourselves the Fiquete Ceres, the Black Brigade. Some of us were quartered here when we first noticed your father, who was a native-born Hungarian. Fifteen years ago, almost to a day, a beggar came running down this road with news for me, terrible news it was, of how a jeweler had become a werewolf a thing neither beast nor man, and had slain his wife while in the wolf shape, and repentant, awaited someone to slay him in turn. Quick with the information, I had my horse saddled, and, with a half troop of my riders following, set out to save the man. It would have been a great deed for me to bring a werewolf alive before the king. The werewolf, though often spoken of, is rarely seen, one meets many a man who says that a friend of his has seen and fought with one, but it always turns out that this friend got his information from another friend, and so on. I expected, therefore, to gain promotion if I brought a real werewolf to the court, but I never did. Could I walk today, I would still be a captain and no more. 
The poor beggar, like the fool he was, stopped in the village before he came to me. It was ten miles to the village from the werewolf's house, and he might have hoped that someone would buy him a drink for the news he had run nearly to Ponkert. So he babbled out his story to anyone who would listen, and they were many. But I fear he did not drink. I know Ponkert men. Then, when everyone in town had gone to kill the jeweler, the beggar came to me. They had over an hour's start, but my horse was fast and my spurs were sharp. I reached him just in time to save him from death by the spear of a tanner. I struck the tanner over the head with my sword, this very sword that you see here, but not to kill, only to stun. Still, I struck too hard and addled his wits, so that he has been an idiot ever since. You have seen him often. He helps the blacksmith with his work, the heavy work that takes no skill. We took the jeweler to the barracks, and he told us his tale. Ivga, we were hardened soldiers, used to battle, murder, and sudden death, crimes and horrors of all descriptions, but some among us were sickened as he told us the things that had been done to him and the sights he had seen. And the pity of it was that it had not been voluntary. He had sold his soul, but under the compulsion of a black fiend, a monster that he called the Master, but whom he knew could be none but the arch-enemy in person. There was not a man of us with dry eyes when he told, in his dreary voice, of the manner in which his master had forced him to kill his wife and carry his baby girl out for the pack, all because he had tried to escape from the one who owned him body and soul. He asked for our help, and we gave it. We fought Satan and lived, most of us. And although we killed all the pack in a trap, the master escaped and still lives somewhere. Of course we could not kill him, He was no man to be killed. So we brought back the jeweler and imprisoned him in a dungeon until he recovered from wounds that he had suffered in the fight. In the meantime, I sent a report to the king. The royal command returned that we should end the existence of the werewolves of Ponkert by making an example of the one that remained, that his hide should be tanned, and upon it written the story of his fall to warn any who might learn of it that the master was to be shunned. Then came word, as he lay in prison, that his baby was not dead. It had been rescued by a hunter in the forest. Secretly, I told him, for, although there were orders that he should not know, I pitied him. He asked my promise that I would always fill a father's place in her life. I gave my oath, the oath of a Helgar, which has never been broken. Later, in his confession, I read that he wished he had known me earlier so that we might have been friends. It would have been well for both of us. He was a brave spirit, for there was a smile on his lips and a jaunty tilt to his hat as he went to the gallows. His name was Vladislav Benrik, and I have kept my promise to him. You are his daughter, a fact that no one has ever dared to tell you for fear of me. Your father's skin was made into a book, bound in leather, and hung from the gallows for a time. Then it was removed to the church, where it now is. The stars told that midnight was near, when, from the streets, a girl entered Ponkert's church. Beneath it were hewn many cells in the living rock, and into one of these she came from out a labyrinth of underground passages. The light of the candle that she bore showed that the mark of tears was on her pale cheeks, and her face was set in old lines. By Dimitri's directions she had found the correct room, although she had never been beneath the church before, and alone she entered unobserved. Every man and woman in Ponkert knew the whereabouts of that cell and the horror it contained. All who could read the book of human hide, and they were few, had done so, 
but no one was unfamiliar with the story written in it. Yet so powerful is dread that while Dmitri Helgar walked in the streets, his ever-present sword with him, no word was ever spoken where the girl might hear. Although she had heard of the werewolf pack that long ago had laid waste the country, it was the one event that Ponkert had of which to boast, people marking time from the slaughter of the pack, she had never imagined that Dmitri was not her father. Now the living and the dead were to meet for the first time. She advanced timidly into the dark room. There was no visible means of ventilation, but the air was dry and pure. A rough bench stood in a far corner. This, with the exception of a heavy stool, was the only article of furniture that the room contained. Upon the bench lay a long taper and materials for its lighting. Beside them, out of any possible reach of moisture or decay, the book lay, covered by a linen cloth. She lit the taper and fixed it in its socket on the wall. Then, reverently, she lifted away the cloth and touched the book with loving fingers. All that remained on earth of the father she had never known lay before her between two thick leather covers. The book was chained to a staple deep sunk in the wall. Softly, her white fingers stroked the pages of human parchment and a sob caught in her throat. Her whole being called out for her unknown parents, for some affection in her love-starved existence. Only those who had never known the love of a mother can realize the value of it. Now all the suppressed longing of her life came rushing upon her, and she cried aloud in the stillness, O oh, father, mother, if I could only see you once, I am so lonely and so afraid, can't you help your little girl? There was no sign nor answer in the cell. The taper burned evenly as before. She lifted the cover and began to read. From its pages it seemed that her father was speaking, as though the account had been written for her alone. To his daughter, the werewolf of Ponkert, told his tragic story across the years. As she read how he had met the master and was enslaved, of his mental agony as he tried to break loose from his miserable bondage, of his final success, she began to hate the master with a deep, abiding hate. It was he who had broken three lives along with countless others. It was he who had escaped unhurt when his poor victims had been killed in the ruined castle. It was he who even now roamed somewhere, scheming to accomplish more evil. To what purpose? None of those he injured had harmed him, yet, like a fiend, he passed from one crime to another. Behind him were broken hearts and blasted lives. A bitter anger against him seized the girl. Anger turned to wonder, for, in the silent room, something else was moving. A sweet peace drowned her black wrath, and though nothing was visible, a still small voice murmured. Not with the gross ear of flesh was the sound intercepted, but with the inner sense that yearned so desperately for love. And the voice said, Hate him not, my darling, he has suffered more than we. Chapter 3 She stared vainly around the chamber. Who spoke? she said her voice rasping loud and harsh in the quiet room. The contrast told her instantly that it was no mortal who was present. The calm and beautiful tones flowed on placidly. One felt that the stranger was beyond human passions, a disinterested specter of the earthly struggle. Hate spoils the mind, Ivga. Hate no one. Pity him rather. That would hurt him more if he knew. His proud spirit cannot bear to be pitied. The master likes to rule over all and denies that he is unhappy. But we who know his sorrow pity him, though we can never forgive. Bitter times are coming, little daughter. 
We cannot help you, but we are watching near you always. In your darkest hour, do what you believe is right, and you will be happy. The voice faded and died away. On her forehead, Ivka felt a light touch and a dainty perfume drifted by. In a second, the girl felt that she was being watched by many benighted eyes. Then, an ineffable sense of peace and security soothed her trouble, and her unseen observers had gone. In the chamber, far beneath the ground and secure from any draughts, the lighted taper flickered. Again, that sweet fragrance permeated the atmosphere in elusive wisps. Just once she thought she heard the faint rustle of a woman's skirts, then nothing. She stared about the chamber, already doubt was invading her mind, yet the taper had not done with trembling, and the aroma still lingered. Oh mother, my mother, she whispered, I have heard you, I have, but I wish I could have seen you, I would have loved you so much. She closed the book and replaced the cloth over it. Then, relighting her candle, she blew out the taper flame and left the cell. By the time she came from the church, it was well past midnight, and a brave wind rumpled her hair about her face as she stepped out upon the street. There is something in the feel of the rushing air which blows away the unhealthy miasmas from the brain so that Ivga had not walked far before she felt more at ease. Her steps quickened, as though she journeyed toward a meeting, yet she was scarcely aware of the direction in which she was travelling. Dimly conscious that she was within the forest, she realised that she had passed her home and turned back. As she did so, there came a sweet music of plucked strings far away, and then a clear voice singing in the distance and coming up the forest path from the road she had left. The words were simple, the pathetic song of an elf to his fairy sweetheart who had deserted him for a mortal lover. The air was familiar to her, but the voice was new. Upon a stone by the side of the path, she sat and drew a leafy bough down about her. Waiting there, she was hidden and could listen to the strange voice and perhaps see who the singer was that sang in the night. The song came nearer. It is necessary to go back a little, after the caravan had made camp and food had been properly disposed of. Young Gana and a companion returned to the village to see the new sights. He looked for the girl as they passed the cottage, but she was nowhere to be seen, and the two went on. In Ponkert, after hours of music, wine, and dance, where Hugo made pleasure for the villagers with his bandura by playing the ballads of far times and places, his companion left the young singer. Later, Hugo also quitted the tavern and commenced back to camp. As he walked, his pockets chinked pleasantly, for Hugo's songs were not free. Somewhat stimulated by the load of coin and inward excitement, he slung the bandura from his back and swept his fingers across the strings. Taking a shorter way through the forest than the road would prove, he walked among the trees, singing as he moved. Dancing down a beam of light, there came a dainty fairy sprite. Too well she loves a mortal, though he is in rags bedight. When wandering over hill or plain, Laughing rill or stormy main, she's guarding him from every woe, his sorrow is her pain. His mortal eyes are blind to thee, this glorious love he cannot see. How canst thou vainly love him so, and never glance at me? Abruptly the song was cut short. Something darker than the shadows had moved in the gloom beneath a low tree branch. Quick as thought itself, the boy hurled himself at the prowler, for the times were hard. Men did not skulk for any good purpose by the side of the road, watching passers-by at night, and attack was ever the best mode of defence. The two bodies struck together, and the spy was overthrown by the blow, falling face down in a patch of moonlight, lying there very quietly. 
The dagger was ready in the young man's hand as he bent over the prostrate figure and gripped it roughly by the shoulder. A second later his fingers loosened on the blade and it dropped to the sod. He sprang to his feet as though his hand had been bitten, wiped off his plumed red cap and stood there, face fiery with shame and embarrassment, stammering idiotic apologies to the crumpled girl who lay still, face hidden in her arms. Inanity after inanity stuttered forth in French, Hungarian and Romany dialects, and receiving no answer, he began to back away, forgetting his dagger. Before he had taken two steps, his heel caught in a root and flung him solidly to the earth. The breath whooped out of him in an explosive grunt. Startled silence was broken by a strange sound from the girl. He saw that her shoulders quivered, and then the sound was repeated, a delightful, half-defiant, half-frightened giggle. He was beside her on his knees at once. At least, judging by her voice and contours, she was not very old, nor did she seem to be angry. Are you laughing at me? He whispered. Let me see your face, please. I am sorry I struck you. I thought you were a robber. Please. And gentle, questing fingers found her chin and turned her head. Recognition was instant and mutual. Both smiled as each recognized the other, for although they had met and parted in a few minutes without a word between them, to each had come something that bound them irresistibly together. That rare, fine emotion was theirs, which only a few ever know, a tender joy in each other's presence that when one is gone makes of life an empty and useless thing for the other left alone. And now, while they gazed upon each other once again, firmer grew the bonds of love, and it seemed that they were not late acquaintances, but had long been friends and lovers. I crave your pardon, said the boy. I wanted so much to see you again, and now I have hurt you. I grieve. You wish to see me? Amazedly questioned the girl, and he smiled in return. He had known before she spoke that her voice would be sweet, and now the very accent seemed dearly familiar. Me, said Ivga, do you know who I am? I know. Mirko the chief has told me of you. I believe you have been unjustly persecuted, and I would like to be your friend, if I may. I have no friends, she answered, now sitting up cross-legged, small hands on her knees, eyeing him wide-eyed and solemn. Never has anyone wanted to be my friend but Dimitri. Hugo felt a hot tide of jealousy surge through him, jealousy that anyone but him should be in the heart of this strange girl, jealousy that quickly passed as she continued, but Dimitri is old, and you are young like me. I have never played with anyone who was not afraid of me. I am not afraid of you, stoutly asserted the boy. No, I do not think you are, and I am glad we can be friends. I like you. Do you like me? She asked, with the charming simplicity of a little child. Very much, was the ardent reply. Then my name is Ivga, Benrik. She hesitated over the last unfamiliar name. And yours? I am Hugo Gunnar, late of France, and now a gypsy wanderer. You do not look like a gypsy, though I saw you with them at dusk, so big on your horse. Do you lead your band? Gunnar wondered just how much she knew, decided not to risk it, and modestly admitted that he didn't exactly command the troop, but left the vague idea that his was the guiding mind. The girl was properly impressed and said so. So, in the age-old way, two had met and were on the way toward life and love together. From that meeting, apparently so casual, innocent and ordinary, events were to spring that would stay the course of progress for many years in Europe, deal civilization itself a mighty blow from which it is even yet recovering. Mighty forces were busy that night, unseen and undreamed of by the chatting couple, and it is not too much to believe 
that the entire meeting had been foreseen and arranged. But the two were conscious of none but themselves. For them, the world was now a pleasant place, and for Ivga, this was the first happiness since she was old enough to know that she was hated. So the night wore on, the stars paled in the east, and still they talked, until reluctantly the girl felt that she must return. Come, she said, walk with me through the wood, I will go home now. Hand in hand, like children, they strolled beneath the shadowing trees toward the Helgar cottage, and the way was all too short for both. They stopped at the door, but Hugo did not release her hand. Tomorrow I shall see you. It was more a statement than a question that he whispered. Yes, tomorrow, she breathed, hesitated. Then, with a flash of daring, she said, Would it were morning now? Desire flamed up in his eyes, and he took a step toward her. Frightened at her audacity, she had already snatched her fingers from his warm clasp and slipped through the door. As she entered, he caught her shoulder, and his arms went about her to hold her close, a prisoner there, all woman now, and yearning for his touch. Her lips sought his and clung for a moment. Then her hands fluttered against his chest like prisoned birds, and she pushed him away, sobbingly. We must not. I am the werewolf's daughter. Please go away. I love you, he cried. I would love you no matter what you were. And he seized her fiercely again. You hurt me, she wailed softly. Please let me go. The blood of many nobles told. His arms went limp. The hand upon her shoulders slipped down her arm in a long caress and touched her fingers. Slowly he bowed his head, as one might to some loving, imperious princess, kissed her small palm and closed her fingers over it. Keep this for me until tomorrow, he murmured. I am sorry. I love you. Good night. Tomorrow, she echoed in just the ghost of a whisper, and the door closed. A short time he stood in the pebbled path, thoughtfully gazing at the unresponsive door. Then he went back along the road. Somewhere he had mislaid his dagger. Was his heart also mislaid beyond the finding? He did not know. Chapter 4 They had spoken of tomorrow, but the word should have been today to be truthful. As Hugo walked into camp, little birds were singing in that half-light which heralds morning. He lay down in his usual cart with his clothes on, for he knew the call would soon come for a rising. Before he was near sleep, a harsh peal brayed from the cook's wagon, and soon that dignitary appeared in the open, a cow's horn in hand. Upon this he blew a second blast, and a general stir of rising and sleepy grunts of protest were heard from the covered carts. Hugo slipped from his bed and, being already dressed, was one of the first to help at kindling fire. Now a bustle of yapping dogs told of breakfast, and things began to appear more cheery to tired men as they had something to kick at and curse. Breakfast vanished with speed and in large quantities, and the business of the day began. This was the first morning of the three days in Ponkert, and there was much work to do. The camp was not yet completely set in order, and there was tugging and hauling of carts into positions better than the hurried selections of the night before. Driven by the gruff orders of Mirko, men scurried about, setting up a little platform at one end of the open ground. Upon this stage, with the forest for a backdrop and the sky for a canopy, entertainment would be presented for the villagers. At the other end, near the road, a heap of rock arose as if by magic and was quickly formed into a rude but serviceable forge. A portable smithy was a necessity to such a troop, and to it, after the few horses that had cast shoes had been shod again, Hugo repaired in a moment's leisure. 
In his hand, he bore an odd weapon. In length, it was all of four feet. It might have been termed a sword, except that it had neither edge nor point. It was nothing more than a rod of steel, fixed into a basket sword hilt, as thick as a man's thumb where it joined the hilt, and oval rather than round. It tapered rapidly toward the tip, where it was, perhaps, a quarter of an inch in thickness, and the same in breadth. This blunt tip Hugo thrust into the coals, and plying the bellows, he soon had a leaping flame. When the steel had taken the desired colour, he drew it out. With a small hammer, he commenced to draw out the tip into a point of exceeding fineness. He was engaged upon his work when he heard a voice behind him. Ivka stood there. Dropping the hammer, he snatched off his cap and made a low salutation. A wondrous morning, he smiled. I trust your majesty slept well. Divinely, she returned in the same joking spirit, but not long. I warrant, said the boy, you would like to walk about the camp. So, by his side, Ivka saw the little stage where tumblers were at practice, visited a blind harper who played a quaint air of the Southland, and was introduced to an old woman whom the youth called Clauda, who crossed herself furtively as the girl turned her head away to watch a half-tamed wolf fighting with a dog from the town. For, by this time, a sprinkling of villagers were mingling with the gypsies, and certain silver pieces were already in different pouches than they were at daybreak. Clauda, now that she was not noticed, skulked into a tent, lifted the back flap, and by a roundabout way, keeping out of sight of the girl, gained her own tent and did not return. None knew better than old Clauda the danger of being old and lean and odd of face. Many an old woman had crackled at a stake, on no better proof of witchery, and to be seen with such a suspicious one as this girl, when townsmen were about, savoured to Clauda most strongly of suicide. She was not seen about the grounds until the girl had gone. The departure was somewhat hastened by a crowd of children, who, increasing in numbers and boldness, followed the two as they moved from one curious scene to another. At last they became noisy and virulent, and Hugo turned upon them, jaw out thrust and eyes blazing. What's odd with you? he scowled. Did you never see me before? Can I not walk with a lady without a company at my heels? It was a town boy that answered from a mind biased by the prejudices of his elders. You I know not, nor care to, but the lady, an unpleasant accent on the word, that you have with you, we know well, and a most sickening smell of sulphur clings to her. Hugo caught him a clout with a hard fist that sent him reeling, but the girl prevented the blow from being followed by another. White-faced, she drew him away. I am sorry, I have brought trouble to you, she said, when they were again alone. I should not have come. And she walked along with her gaze upon the road. Do not mind them, Ivga, he comforted. It was but children's talk. They know no better. Not all, she replied sorrowfully. They all hate me here. Where did he learn that? From what others say about me who would love them all? It was only a word, but a spark shows the direction of a wind and little words like that will light a flame against me soon. Is it as bad as that? The youth asked. Dimitri has advised me not to leave his sight any more, was the indirect answer. And you disobeyed to see me? Hugo exclaimed joyfully. Ivka laughed a little. How I do talk on such a lovely day. Let us be happy and save this for some other time. Let us go to the woods and I will show you Ponkert from the old haunted castle on the hill. But I must work, Hugo protested, more than willing for a holiday, but wondering what Mirko would think of his delinquency. Love you your task, then? she pouted. Why, go you to it if you must, and she turned toward the forest path. 
Wait, he cried. I will come. Let me get my sword. He ran back to the forge and recovered the uncompleted weapon. She was waiting in the forest when he came. They walked through the woods, and she teased him about his weapon. This toy was no sword for a man to carry. Nay, it was no sword at all, but only a knitting needle that she could use herself. Now her father had a sword that was worth seeing. Seeing Hugo's glum look, she became penitent and was forgiven, but first exacted a promise that he would come on the morrow to see her foster father's sword. He, in return, offered to bring Clauda to tell the fortunes of both the girl and Dimitri. At last they came to the old ruined castle upon the hill overlooking the river, forest, Ponkert, and the plain. Here, resting beneath the very crumbling wall from which once the master had leapt to safety, the youth observed another mountain, far away, near the river which almost encircled Ponkert, but on the other side of the village. The top of this peak was divided in two, as though split down part way with a giant axe. Curious, he asked its name. It has no name, replied Ivga. I call it my mountain, for I am there much. On the side near the river, father and I have a little boat where we go to fish and play. Or we did, long ago. She fell silent, thinking of far-off happy days when Dimitri's legs were strong. It must be hard to climb, he said idly, not dreaming of the conditions that would soon cause him to know just how hard it was to gain the summit. It is, said Ivga, very hard. No one goes there but me. I can be all alone up there and forget how people hate me and be happy with the wind. And when I am all alone, so high, I feel closer to heaven, mother and my father too. They are happy because they are dead and have each other. They loved and were not long apart after mother died. What father did was not his fault. He was made into a werewolf. He did not seek it, as many have. Because of that, they hate me. I do not hate you, Ivga, said Hugo, and took her hand. Have you forgotten last night and what we said this morning? The curls shook vigorously. No, but you were wrong. You did not know I was so bad. You said you loved me. She looked down at the distant village. They will hurt you some way if you stay here. You must go away when the band goes. You will find someone else, better than I am. The words caught in her throat, but she went on bravely with a steady voice. Someone not cursed, and I hope you'll be very happy with her. There were tears in her dark eyes now, but her voice did not tremble. So it is a pretty dream, but it must die. No one can ever love me, never. The brown head sank low. I am the werewolf's daughter, shunned, hated, and feared by all, cursed at birth and despised by even the children. There is not, nor can there be, any love or rest for me in all this ugly world, she said bitterly and drew her hand away. Peace, he whispered, and laid his fingers across her sullen lips. I love you and shall love you always. How can you be so sure, she breathed. He bent his head and, seeing the look in her eyes, kissed her cheek. Then, greatly daring, found her lips with his and was not denied. She lay quiescent in his strong embrace, and presently her arms went about his neck and drew him closer. Held captive, a willing prisoner, he felt as though his wandering was at an end, and he was come home at last. She moved away and looked at him, studying his earnest face. Hugo, what are we to do? Will you take me with you when you go? I could not, he said frightened at the thought. You would not be safe with us. Anything might happen. No, I will have to stay here with you. That I will not have you do. It is more dangerous here for you than it would be for me to go. But, she paused, what is it? Dimitri, I cannot go. He would be all alone. The youth started to speak, but she smiled. 
Never mind. We will forget it and be happy now, while we can. Tell me a story, Hugo. Now, you are from France, you say. Is it far away? Very, very far. Many days' journey, even for horses. I have heard tales of France, but I have never seen it, said the girl wistfully, as she sat gazing across the valley, hands locked about her knees. Tell me, is it a lovely land? Hugo, remembering his home, knew it to be beautiful, and being far away, memories portrayed it still more pleasantly than he had known it. From that picture, he described his home and country, finishing, In France, the flowers are lovelier and more fragrant than here. The birds carol sweeter because they are French. Why, even the sun shines brighter over Blois than Poncourt, and the blue of the sky. O oh, Ivga, you cannot imagine how lovely it all is. I think the floor of heaven must hang very low over Blois. Well, decided the girl in a judicious tone, it is nice up here too, sometimes. And now for the story. I must have a story. Hugo grinned. Must? Listen then and I will tell you a story of my family long ago, and then you will know why I am not afraid of a werewolf's little daughter. It is told of our house that very long ago there was a count who lived under a dreadful spell, being at certain changes of the moon sorely afflicted by a transformation of his body into that of a wolf. At such times he would roam the forests after hiding his clothes in a sure place known only to himself. It was a part of the witchery that without his clothes he might never resume his shape. Now, the Count's wife was evilly disposed toward him, yearning greatly toward a young soldier of the castle guard. With diligent and tormenting questions, she discovered his secret and watched for an opportunity. When he wandered again, she followed at a distance, stole his garments from their concealment, and fled to the castle. After a decent time, she gave out that the Count was dead, but his magic garb she laid away. Why didn't she burn them? The girl inquired logically. I don't know, Hugo confessed. It didn't seem very wise of her, but she did keep them. The Count roamed the country for long, after he knew he could not become a man again, and his heart was full of wrath against his faithless lady. He went hungry often when he might have eaten, for he would not slay the innocent and helpless, but preyed only on real wolves and dangerous animals of the forests. He became gaunt with famine, and his body scarred with battles, so one day when the nobles were hunting and the dogs cried behind him, he could not outrun them. He burst through the pack and laid hold with his teeth upon the stirrup of the king who was among the hunters and whom he had known in his former life. Oh, gasped Ivga, did they kill him? Not at all, Hugo answered. They were going to do so, but the gracious king saw there were tears in the wolf's eyes and that he fawned piteously upon those who came to spear him rubbing against their legs like a cat. The king, sensing sorcery, commanded that the werewolf should be given quarters in the palace until such time as he should regain his former shape, and that he should be called Gunnar. While he dwelt among them, many tried their skill at breaking the spell, but to no avail. One day, a great ball was held at the palace. Nobles from all the country were present, and in their number came the heartless lady, now wived to her guilty lover. While they danced in gay ignorance, Gunnar rose from where he had lain couched before the throne as a trusted pet, and with a silent bound, flung himself upon the defilers of his honour. Her paramour she slew, but contented himself with one snap at his false lady, which left her noseless to her death. Then, Great excitement arose. Many claimed that the attack was cruel and unjust, and these clamoured for the wolf's death. The wise king, however, mistrusted the countess, caused her to be so treated that she confessed the truth and located the magic garments for the werewolf. 
No sooner had he done them than he became the count and fell at the king's feet, swearing fealty anew to his just rule. From that time he took the name of Gana in gratefulness to the king. His former marriage was annulled, and he married again, more happily than before, and, although he was always subject to the enchantment at moon change, he ever found his garments where he had placed them, and no hunters were allowed to enter the woods he ranged. So you see, little witch, that even if your father was a werewolf, one of my kin was also. Perhaps I might be one too, who knows? Aren't you afraid of me? He smiled into her face as she looked up at him. Not if you love me as much as I do you, she replied demurely, with a twinkle in her eye. Love you, Ivga, I worship you, but take care, don't tease me too much, because you look sweet enough to eat, and I might begin any time, thus. And he caught her hands in his, and began kissing each fingertip in turn, while she touched her lips softly to his thick black hair. Feeling the gentle pressure, he lifted his head quickly, and their lips met. Then a teasing mood seized him. He cried, Be careful, now I am a werewolf. I have you, little one. Shall I bite off your nose? If you can catch me, she laughed as she slipped deftly from his eager arms and ran away toward the river her skirts fluttering about her nimble limbs, and with flushed and happy face, she was a picture of happiness. It is good to love, and to be loved for the first time, when one has been very lonely. And now, believing that Hugo had a dark blot upon his ancestry as well, she did not feel so terribly isolated and alone in her misery. Nor did she ever know that he had lied to her with that exact object in his mind at the time, relating an old legend for her benefit as history and truth. Shouting hoarsely, in mock rage, he followed, and by the riverbank he caught her fast in his arms and held her close. Now you are mine, he panted, and I shall not let you go. You are mine for always, for I love you. We will go away from here, he murmured, We will go back to my father in Blois, who is very rich, and you will be his dear daughter and my love. But, Dimitri, I can't go without him, she said in alarm. I can't leave him while he lives. We'll take him too, the boy promised largely. Our castle is big. There is room enough for all of us. And they sealed the bargain with a kiss. The sun hung low when they left the riverbank, and wandered back toward home, talking together in low tones and planning far ahead. Yet while they chatted, each happily conscious of the other's adoration, events were marching to a dreadful conclusion in Poncourt. The morning before, a wood chopper had gone to his work in the old forest. Two days had all but passed, and he had not returned. At that moment a small band of men were in the forest, searching patiently in the evening gloom. As the sun went down, two men trudged home from their work in Poncourt. Tired, they sometimes stopped to rest. Passing the house of Helgar, they noticed that the door was open and glanced within. The old man lay sleeping in his chair, covered with a robe. The day had been long for him without Ivgar. He had worried, but she had said that she might be gone some while. The river was low, and many of the fish had died, so that the fishing that she proposed to do might not be quickly done. And now he slept and dreamed of Ivga. One of the workmen nudged his fellow. It was the former Tanner, now crazed, on one subject worse than the rest, revenge for the blow which had made him so. See, he muttered to his companion, an evil-browed lout. He is alone. Is now the time? The blacksmith frowned. Always it was necessary to watch his mad helper, lest he do himself or others a mischief. Not yet, he answered. Come away, some other time, not now. The idiot grinned vacuously and resisted the other's restraining clutch, making as though to open the gate 
while he loosened the knife by his side. He struck me once, he growled as he struggled to be free. The other man gripped him fiercely. You cursed fool, now is not the time. The soldiers would be about our ears like bees. Some day they will all be gone. Wait. I have waited fifteen years, he grumbled. You always say that. He allowed himself to be urged down the road. He struck me once, the former Tanner repeated, and turned for a last look. Two persons were coming up from the village, walking slowly. He stopped short, holding back the smith. Look, it is the witch, he muttered. She has trapped a gypsy. He will die within the week. Nay, denied the smith, as he saw who walked beside the girl. I saw them this morning walking together, and he went willingly. Tis no beguilement of hers. He went willingly. Then he is a sorcerer too. Are you mad as these fools say I am? Would he go with her, knowing what she is, were he not as bad or worse? He is another menace to the town, and they should both be burned. The smith blinked stupidly at the idea. He was not quick of wit, and the thought seemed good to him. You are right, Vesoscus, he unwillingly agreed, revolving within his dull brain plans by which he might tell others on the morrow of the wondrous idea, and by naming the boy as a sorcerer, gain fame and credit for being a man of keen insight among the village folk. They moved along, talking, and behind them came the girl and Hugo, having no eyes for anything but each other. Neither suspected how the threads of destiny were being wound together into a cord that might mean death for all. Chapter 5 Women talked in little groups the next morning, and there was a general air of suspense and expectancy in Ponkert for most of the day. It began at sunrise with a story told by one of those who had been at the gypsy camp, and, in the repeating, the tale grew huge and dangerous. As told by a woman in a group by the village well, it ran something like this. You have not heard the evil that befell my little Milo. Yesterday he said something to the witch when she was at the gypsy camp, and she told a great brute of a gypsy that was with her to kill him. The beast knocked my poor boy down and trampled on him, but he crawled away. Then she cursed him, and see, when he was coming home, he climbed a tree to swing on the branches, and a branch broke. His leg is now broken. May her bones be crumbled in fire, or rot away while she lives. I, chimed in another, remember how my lad was killed, just for striking her with a stone it was, in childish fun. Was he not missing only a month later, and found buried in the sand pit, where she had caused the bank to slide upon him. Remember the widow Capilock's pigs, how they sickened and died after she was found watching them one day, and the old woman drove her away. And the blinding of young Switty, only last season. Recall the day he was led out of the wood, half mad, with his eyes blown out, when his gun exploded. Did he not say that the witch had punished him for staring at her over long? So the tales flew. Each natural calamity discussed only from one point of view, and all revolving around a single hub, the suspected witch. Was the summer dry so that the crops were poor and the river low? The witch was to blame. Did the sheep die from an odd sickness that year? Ivga again, and ever through the talk that day, ran two reoccurring motifs. The sending of a curse on Milo the day before, as he had lyingly claimed to his mother, and the yet unsolved mystery of the missing woodchopper now in his third day of absence. The searchers had straggled in late the night before, their hunt to no purpose, and now they were gone again. They searched the woods and hills systematically with slow, patient care, where before they had been hurried and less thorough for now all knew he must be dead. And through the village a suspicion grew, hourly more defined, though no one knew who first had uttered it, 
that the manner of his passing had not been a natural one. People longed with a dreadful sadistic desire that the thing they suspected would prove true. What was it that had killed the missing man? Not a hint of this unrest came to the cottage beside the road, for no one tarried that passed that way. Hugo had heard rumours early in the day when he brought Clauda, the future reader, to visit the girl, but he said nothing to alarm her. Clauda was less considerate. She had had no desire to come, and only Hugo's insistence that she oblige him and his positive belief that she would not be seen had brought her there. Once there, she dispatched her business in haste and left with no wish to linger. From an ink horn, she poured a black pool into Dimitri's palm and peered into it, her small, sunken eyes restlessly seeking for knowledge. Dimitri, unbelieving and sceptical, asked if she could see him walking in that pool of ink. Yes, said old Clauda, once more you will walk, once more you shall fight, but from that fight you come never back. No feet of arms shall slay you, but I see you dying among a heap of slain. Rocky walls on each side reach high. It is dark, I can see no more. If no trick of battle causes my end, said Dimitri, who then shall kill me? Can you see? Look again. His face I cannot see. The night is heavy on the battlefield, but this I know, a dead man shall slay thee. You speak in riddles, Clauda, said Hugo, vexed by such an unhappy introduction to Ivga's guardian, and fearing lest this might prove a poor beginning for all his great plans. You brought me here. I did not wish to come. I have told the truth. Do not be angry, Clauda, said the youth coaxingly. A nice reading now, for Ivga, please. What is her future to be? Pour the ink. I will not touch her hand. Pour the ink yourself. Hugo filled the girl's hand with the fluid, and the old crone bent over the pool with mingled dread and curiosity. A long time she looked, and as they watched, her face grew white and strained. At last she looked up. I can see nothing, Clauda said evenly. I will not look again. Come back with me, Hugo. There is danger here. After a little time, mother, after a little, the boy laughed away his own disturbed thoughts. Woe and sorrow rest upon this house, wailed the crone, and then returned to camp. After she had gone, Ivga showed him gate opener, and Dmitri told him all that he knew about it. Together, they disposed over his worry, over the reading of the prophetess, and made him feel more easy and at home. Not even the grandfather of Dmitri knew much of Gate Opener's past, save that its age was great. Its very appearance spoke of antiquity to those who knew swords well. Hugo's cheek flushed as he gazed upon it, and compared it to that other legendary sword, Durandal, which it so much resembled. From similar times they came, thought the boy. Perchance it may have swung and flickered icily upon some battlefield where thirsty Durandal was also drinking deep from the cup of a shattered skull. So, dreaming of mightier days, he patted the hilt of the keen and ponderous brand. When Hugo had quite finished with admiring the enormous broadsword, Ivga commanded with a delightfully imperious air of ownership that the boy show his own tiny weapon. Reluctantly, he drew his rapier and laid it across the old man's knees. Although four feet long, beside gate opener, it was as insignificant as a dagger. Dimitri's voice was grave, but around his lips there lurked the faintest suspicion of a smile while Ivga did not trouble to hide her amusement at this ridiculous comparison. What might be the use of this toy? asked Dmitri, his pleasant voice taking some of the sting from his words. Sire, replied the boy, 
bowing to hide the quick flush of resentment. In the right hands, it is capable of making widows. Ah, queried Dmitri, and has it been used for that purpose? Not as yet, sire, for it is but lately finished, the point I made this morning. Then how can you be so certain of its worth? Its value has been proved in battle, replied Hugo proudly. My father was the first to fight with this type of sword, and it began thus. When my father was a very young man, our castle was besieged by an enemy who at one time entered the walls and almost conquered us. The fighting was hand to hand, and all who could bear arms fought beside our men-at-arms and peasants. My father chanced to have his sword broken in his hand and was beaten to his knees by the man who fought against him. As the man swung up his sword to cleave my father in two, father's hand fell upon a fragment of spear, and leaning forward beneath the descending blade, he ran the soldier through. When the battle was over and we had won, father, being of an ingenious turn of mind, bethought himself of a new weapon, in shape a sword, but to be used in an unusual way. It should remain secret and thus carry surprise with it. It should be edgeless, therefore round, and amazingly sharp in point, like a cook's spit. It should be light in weight, the easier to parry with, and possess a good grip for the hand. Here you see it. Dmitri examined the primitive rapier critically. It has a wicked look, yet it is made for boys, not men to play with. Old gate-opener here, and he slapped the hilt of the broadsword affectionately, would make six of this, this, he hesitated. Knitting needle, supplied Ivka, laughing. To every man his weapon, smiled the youth, but the smile was only with his lips. Would you see how one may play with it? Without waiting for an answer, he snatched his rapier from the old man's lap and sheathed it, then walked to the fireplace and selected a billet of wood nearly four inches thick. Standing near the wall, he tossed the stick into the air. Before it had begun to fall, he whipped out his sword, more quickly than the eye could see the motion. Dmitri and Ivka heard a thud, and the boy stepped back, empty-handed. Against the wall of the room, the rapier trembled, driven through the stick, which it had pinned to the wall. Now, said Hugo quizzically, if that had been a man. Dmitri did not show the surprise he felt. Is the steel as strong as your wrist? He asked. Nearly, Hugo grinned. See, seizing the hilt, he tore the rapier from the wall and set his foot upon the stick, then pressing sideways, bent the slender blade into an arc, after which he pulled it from the stick and returned it to the old man for examination. The point was apparently as needle-sharp as before. My father taught me many things with such toys, and my brothers and I have practiced daily with them since we were strong enough to lift one. Owls is the only family which knows their value. Dmitri, having learned all that he wished, changed the subject abruptly. You spoke of our castle, he said bluntly. Does that mean you are noble in your land? The name of Gunnar is famous in France. I am a Gunnar. Then how comes it that you trail with gypsies? I was headstrong and the youngest son, answered Hugo somberly. Father and I quarreled, so I am here. Is it an answer? It is enough, replied Dmitri. Ivga, will you bring us wine? In this way, the two, who each in his own way loved the friendless girl, looked upon each other and were satisfied. Each found the other a man to whom his heart warmed. So they met and parted, never to meet again, for Hugo did not enter the cottage that evening after he and Ivga had walked together along the river bank and planned and planned, very far ahead that afternoon, meaning to take Dmitri with them 
when the caravan left. But in after years, Hugo remembered that day and Dimitri's simple, kindly smile, so loving when he spoke to Ivga, and often wondered how the three of them could have been so blind to the shadow that all the day was gathering closer about them. In the streets, the women talked and waited. In the forest, men searched, hoping, yet fearing to find what they were certain would be found. And that for which they sought lay hidden by brush beside a fallen oak in territory which had been gone over several times. So securely was it laid away that only those who had cunningly hid it there knew its hiding place. Only those, and now and then an inquiring fly that buzzed down hungry and arose later on sluggish wing, flying heavily away. So ended the second of the caravan's three days in Ponkert. That night, the searchers did not come home, but hunted by the light of torches, and by morning were scattered thinly through the forest. The sun was two hours high when a man, leaping over a fallen tree, fell short into the brush, and, for the space of a second, lay face to face with the dead. Then from the woods arose a cry, a vengeful whooping and halloo, that rose and sank, tossed from one to another of the searchers, and carried on, as when the deer is sighted, the hounds give tongue. From all the forest rose the cry, Found! He is found! And from a score of points, the men converged toward the spot where the body lay, until all had come and clustered around. He was grievously torn and mangled, scarcely to be recognized as human, but they knew by certain garments and his axe that it was the woodchopper. His wood chopped, his wandering done, his axe lay idle at last. Still and quietly he lay, and quietly, ominously so, the group of men stood and stared at the sad ruin the forest beasts had wrought. Men that search for a definite thing twist all they see toward the supporting of their belief. Every man in the band would have sworn that it was not wolves that had killed the woodsmen, though the tracks were thick and plain for all to see. Through the crowd burst a lad, fierce and wild-eyed, and cried, Where? Where? to the men so grimly silent. Spying the body, he fell upon it, sobbing out his grief to the cold ears, for it had been his brother. Gentle hands lifted the lad away, and pitying voices mumbled stiff and stumbling words of sympathy. But the boy would have none of pity, and with the first intolerance of youth, he struck away the comforters. O oh Christ, he sobbed, how long do we stand the curse that lies upon this town? How long do we groan under the rule of this seed of the fiend? Sickness, famine, and sorrow have we had. The river wanes away, the sheep die, terror stalks in the streets at night, and now this. Oh, my brother, my brother, we will avenge you soon, but how much longer do we wait? The men shifted on uneasy feet. Neighbor looked furtively at neighbor and quickly turned his glance away. Each read the other's thought and found him willing for desperate and unholy deeds as the boy raved on. Owned we are by this devil chick, this werewolf's daughter. Are we slaves or men? I say to you all that if you do not help to end this menace to our happiness and lives, I will kill this witch myself. From the crowd, one pressed forward, the idiot Tanner. I will help, he chuckled. Give me old Helga, and I will help. He struck me once. I will help too, came a second voice, as another was encouraged by this example and stepped to the front. The men chorused a willingness, with only a few holding back. Why do you wait? cried the boy. Come, did you ever see wolf tracks as large as this? 
he pointed to the signs in the rich loam. Many had indeed seen larger tracks, but so distorted at this moment were their imaginations, and the majority of opinion was so great that those who might have spoken for the girl felt the words die in their throats, for, after all, they were not quite sure. Perhaps the tracks were those of a werewolf, although they were exactly like those of a real wolf. Then they would be making a hideous mistake in attempting to save the girl. And so against their weak judgment they joined the others in the cry for the innocent blood. So shifting is the mood of men that before the mourners reached Ponkert, they were more rabid and vicious than the young lad who had suffered most. Spurred on by the news he bore, a runner had gasped out the story, and, as the band entered the village, a rabble met them, already armed and waiting. Like a revolutionary mob, they filled the street from side to side as all poured on, out of Ponkert to the country road. Ivga had just taken away Dmitri's breakfast dish when gravel crunched in the path and the door crashed open. The room was filled with noise. A dozen hands seized her and buffeted her about as one pulled her from another, striking and bruising her cruelly. Please, what is it? What have I done? stammered the girl. So many told her at once that she did not understand a word and fell silent, giving them stare for stare. Proud, defiant, unbroken she stood and heard Dmitri bellowing curses against them all. Loud, he lamented his crippled legs, breathing terrible threats against the people if Ivga were hurt. He called for a friend, if one were there, to give him his sword that she might have a defender. They did not wish to hurt Dmitri. They respected him still, if they had no fear of him now. Well they knew what would befall them if his soldiers should know he had been injured. To silence him, as much as for any other purpose, a man reached to the wall and flung gate opener down to the floor nearby, but where he could not reach it from his chair. They commenced to drag her out, Ivga not understanding what their intentions were. Dmitri, however, heard the words, Fire! and Square! and was certain of their plans. He raved impotently. And, while he, noisy in his frantic wrath, shrieked damnation against them, there came to a listener in the crowd the memory of a long unavenged wrong, which now would be satisfied as men had promised in the forest that it should be. Chapter 6 The idiot Tanner lurched forward through the crowd, his eyes shining with a mad, fanatical light. He struck me once, hissed through his yellow fangs. Men gave him room because of his fierce aspect and the axe which he bore upon his shoulder. With a sweep of his arm, he hurled the cripple from his chair so that Dmitri lay face down, half stunned and twitching in helplessness. Close beside him lay the sword that was so impotent to aid him now. As the maniac howled in glee and swung up his axe to strike, the girl, weak and suffering from her blows, could bear no more. Her slight form sagged limply in her captor's arms. Mercifully, she had fainted. She did not see the hands that seized the axe in its downward sweep to halt the blow. She did not hear the men who, fearing a reprisal from the soldiers, reasoned with the maniac. While the soldiers would not interfere with the execution of a witch, they would, of a certainty, avenge the cowardly murder of their old and crippled captain. She did not hear the ravings of the maniac, disappointed in his revenge, as he struggled to reach the cripple. The ravings continued until a promise was given 
that Dmitri should be given to the mercies of the former Tanner, following the tortures of the girl on the morrow. It was a promise that was never intended or destined to be kept. She did not feel herself being carried roughly out of doors, jostled and bruised in the press, while the Tanner lagged far enough behind to deal one savage kick to the prostrate cripple. All these things she never knew, and to the day of her death, many years later, she believed that her foster father had met his end beneath the tanner's axe. As the last of the raiders quitted the house, a somewhat darker shadow hovered near the cripple where he lay, hopelessly sobbing in his anger and fear for the girl. For a little space, it hovered as though watching, and then, contrary to the habits of shadows, it moved with no one near, following the path the crowd had taken. At the village, they hastened the fainting girl to the square. They bound her fast with iron chains to the stone post, which rose above a log platform. It was an old scaffold, built for public punishment, with steps leading up from the ground. Upon it were a gallows, a wheel to the purpose of breaking bones, and the post. The latter had an iron floor about it, erected for death by fire. Upon this structure, the martyrdom of the innocent now began. All that sultry afternoon she hung in her chains, the fierce sun beat down upon her unprotected head, and as the day wore to a close, a throbbing began in her temples, and strange, humming noises attacked her ears. In that incredibly long afternoon, she had not one moment's rest from the torment. At first she answered the jibes and taunts that were flung at her by the tormentors, but it only excited them to fresh efforts. Words failing to provide enough amusement, they began to throw other things. Mud flew, small sods, stones, offal, sticks, and once a dead cat. But her spirit was not to be broken by missiles, though her body was near to that point. Many times she searched the howling sea of faces for Hugo, but she did not see him. There were several of the gypsy band who gave her pitying glances, but they turned away when she caught their eyes, knowing that they could not help. At length, a group of villagers unleashed a new torment. Several men ran into the church, pried loose the staple which held the book to the underground wall, and ran back with it to the scaffold. Here, they fastened it to a beam, and set it swinging beside her. The rusty chain squeaked as the book swung, and, to her delirious fancy, it seemed as though it was the voice of a man, crying beneath the tormentor's knife. Father and daughter were together at last upon the scaffold. One was dead, the other near to dying. She bowed her head to hide the tears that formed in her sad eyes, but there were many who saw the evidence that she was hurt at last. There was no pity in Ponkert, how they howled. More than a mile away, Dmitri heard the shout and cursed them. He knew that something new and dreadful had been devised for his loved one, but curses do little harm, and the people enjoyed themselves in their sadistic happiness until night fell. Cruel as they were, they were careful not to kill. A greater entertainment was set for the morning, and a pile of wood and brush rose near the scaffold in readiness for the final sport. The delay was twofold. One purpose was to torture by the night chill, to pain her bruised and stiffened muscles like sharp knives. The second was an even more refined method of torture. The agony and suspense and waiting would make the dark hours seem like years to her. She waited for sunrise, the stake and the flaming death, 
Well they knew that no one could find ease or sleep while hanging in those iron chains that held the wrists. Twilight came. The people left the square, leaving only a sentry to watch the girl, that she might not call for help or vanish by her diabolical arts. As the girl hung, only partly conscious in the chains which bound her to the post, and believing Dimitri dead and Hugo to have forsaken her, she felt that all that makes life worth living had been taken away. Suddenly, she felt something from outside calling gently, insistently, and her spirit tugged at her body, impatient to be free. Although she feared, she did not resist. Her spirit was drawn from her body like a sword from its sheath, and it hovered silently above its former shell. As her astral self hung there, a spirit, invisible to the eyes of the sentry, she seemed to have been lifted into another realm. Here there was no pain nor suffering, no hunger nor thirst, no sorrow nor delight, only a restful sense of peace that permeated her being. She longed to remain in that blissful state forever. She felt that something held her. She looked down to see a wisp of cord connecting this new self with the body she had quitted. Quite naturally, it came to her that if the cord were broken, she would be free, and the torturers that were to come in the morning would be cheated. Timidly at first, then harder, she tugged at the cord. It gave and stretched, but would not snap. At each tug, the body in the straps quivered and twitched. At last it moaned. The sentry started, swore at his nerves, and commenced a dreary, monotonous whistling to keep his courage. The cord stretched thin, swaying in time with the dismal creak and whine of the heavy book which moved on its rusty chains. Soon it would part. Then the girl felt the proximity of another, very near, who radiated such an immense power that it surged in waves through her spirit like an elixir of life. Obeying an unspoken command to turn, she ceased the strain upon the cord and faced the stranger. Instinctively she knew that the spirit was evil. It was neither male nor female in principle, yet seemed both. Like herself it hovered, had limbs and a body, yet was not human. Its face held a sadness which coupled with an apparent confidence in its own power to overcome any obstacle. A frightful sorrow as of one who broods over lost opportunities, having made a mistake which cannot be repaired, and yet knows that he is all-powerful against any foe, so that the spirit's pride was arrogant and domineering. It was a lost soul that stared into the girl's face. Still, she did not feel afraid. She had passed beyond human sensations and left them with the body, bound to the stone post. She knew this creature to be the master, but she was not afraid. As she watched, he addressed her, and his words were wondrous gentle. I have seen your life, your trouble, and the hate of these people for you. Long have I brooded near this village, planning to avenge myself upon your father. He betrayed me in life, although his cause was great. I have been a cruel master ever to my slaves. Your father cheated me, even in death, dying in a manner that forbade my interference. For a time, I meant to wreak my vengeance upon you, the last of the line, trusting that he might see and be punished. You have suffered, I, all your life you have suffered for your father's sin. Hence, it is in my mind to show you mercy. My revenge I must have, and I will, but I can wait. The years are nothing to those who are immortal. I give you choice this night, child of Benric. Become my slave, and I will free you, and the score shall be evened. 
Also the people of Ponkert will suffer most deeply for that which they have done this day. Refuse my offer, and I shall free you still. Your lover shall be yours. All your lifetime you shall go unharmed by me. But at your death, should you leave heirs, then they shall be my fair prey. One from each generation, perhaps more, I shall take, until your line is stamped from the earth. This I promise, and will fulfill. Say, girl, if from your offspring I may have one to do my will. You may, said the girl, aloud, in the flat, dull tone of the hypnotic. It is well, he chuckled, and then in a sly manner he sprang his trap. Of each generation was all that he said, softly and gently, so that they fell upon the ears of the girl without realization of their meaning. The three words spelled sorrow, misery, and terror to countless souls yet unborn, and the girl had the power, by a word, to decide the future of many. Yes, she said dreamily, in her bodily voice, and by a single word she slew many who were yet to be, as surely as though she had laid a knife to their throats. A look of devilish joy swept across the master's distorted face. It is well, he said. Your body will forget these words now. One is coming, even now, to free you. And with these words, he disappeared from her sight forever. Chapter 7 A small groan issued from the prostrate form on the floor of the cottage. The man moved his fingers slightly, as though they clenched on something. He groaned again, after which he began to mumble broken words, face in the dust. Oh God, help me now. Give me back my strength, just for a little while. She is a pretty little girl, and she always loved you. She is so sweet and lovable. Could you let her die? His voice sank into a confidential murmur. You see, I've got to go. I can't stay here while they hurt her. I promised I would always guard and keep her. Must I break my given word? It's a wicked, cruel joke to play this trick with me. I know I've been wicked many times, and I deserve no pity. But don't you see? It isn't for me, I ask. You aren't punishing me, but the little girl. What did she ever do? I don't care what becomes of me. Take my soul and thrust it into the deepest pit of hell, but save her. Oh God, give me back my strength. The feeble voice droned away to silence. Dmitri Helgar, mercenary Czech, captain in the Black Brigade, had finished his first prayer. There was darkness before the fallen figure moved again. The afterglow of sunset was fading, and an early star shone. Strength and a sword, exclaimed Dmitri, in a strong voice, far different from the former tone, although he had not stirred. A sword and an arm to wield it, he said in the tones of one who sleeps, yet speaks. His right arm began to raise itself upon the fingertips, like a monstrous insect blindly sprawling. Like an insect, the hand crawled toward the beloved sword hilt. The fingers missed by inches, but continued to walk as far as the arm's length would permit. Then they moved crabwise, the thumb creeping ahead, digging into the floor, and contracting, thus pulling the hand behind it. At last it touched the cool sword. A great explosive, ah, burst from the pale lips, blowing the dust away as the fingers closed about the hilt. The touch was like the caress of a lover. From the grip on gate opener came power and returning vigor. As he lay there, his wan cheeks flushed with new health. More, even. Whether it was from the prayer 
or from his desperate desire to go to Ivka's rescue, a strange feeling pulsed through his limbs. In legs that had been numb and lifeless for a year, a prickling sensation grew. It passed and returned again, and when it finally disappeared, he found that his feet would move. While he marveled, wrapped with the wonder of the seeming miracle, he heard voices outside the cottage. Two men came laughing down the road, talking loudly as they neared the building. Suddenly they became quiet. Careful footsteps came up to the door and paused. A deep hatred came to Dmitri as he lay rigid, listening. He has not moved. He is dead, whispered one. You killed him with that last kick, Vesoskis. The other laughed evilly. A good deed, then. I owed it to him. No man strikes me, but he pays, sometime. He struck me once. Did I ever tell you? I believe you did, now you speak of it, said the smith sardonically. Come, the night falls. If any soldier should hear of this and see us here, the idiot giggled. Soon, soon, I want to talk to him a bit. Leaning farther through the doorway, he cried, You in there, listen to this. She is in town, fastened to the stake. Wouldn't you like to see your imp now? She won't kill any more men, or blind them for looking at her. We have her fast, and at dawn she burns. The wood is gathered, the pile is ready, and the pitch is at hand. Ha ha! Old man! Old man! Can you hear me in hell, old man? Why don't you answer me? The smith seized him, horrified at this tormenting of a dead man. Come away, you fool, come away, he urged. I hear sounds in the wood. All right, chuckled the tanner, and then to Helgar. I've got to leave you, old man. Remember, at dawn she dies. I'm sorry now that I killed you. Really, I am. If only you could see it. And then his voice was lifted in expostulations against the force his companion was using in dragging him away. As the companions became fainter and could no longer be heard, a tenebrous shadow moved with no body to cause it, and squatted, a puddle of blackness in a corner. And in the deserted cottage, a thing happened which would have chilled the blood of the idiot Tanner. The form he had thought a corpse raised itself upon its knees. For the first time in a year, Dmitri stood erect upon his feet. For a moment he listened by the door, then crossed to the wall, with steps that were wavery and uncertain. He lifted down the leather harness that would fasten the broadsword to his back, and buckled the straps together. Placing gate opener in its sheath, he returned to the door with a surer stride. Though the sword was heavy, he fitted the harness about his shoulders and stood straight in the doorway, looking out over the trees at the stars which gleamed also over Ponkert, a mile away. Reverently, he bowed his head, believing that his prayer had been answered. Every moment now he felt stronger, although his legs were still weak and trembled beneath gate opener's weight. Dmitri had never been a religious man. Indeed, one of his frequent sayings was, If there is a God at all, he must pay more attention to those who are not always bothering him by asking for something. How weary he must be of begging. But now it seemed that even the strong were sometimes weak, and with a full heart he would have worshipped and given thanks, but could find no words. All the while precious time was fleeting by, never to return. He raised his hands beseechingly to the stars and cried, I am coming, Ivga. If you are alive, I will free you or die in Ponkert Square. If they have killed you, look down from the parapets of heaven and watch the wizened souls of Ponkert go squealing by to Satan's halls. And Benric, watch a Helgar keep his promise. He descended the steps and walked slowly into the forest toward the village.
Behind him, a black pool of shadow, darker than the rest of the night shades, flowed down the steps and along the path. It was oddly shaped, as though something stunted and malformed lingered there, suiting its pace to that of the old man just ahead. Yet there was no one else that could be seen walking down the path. At this time, which was about the second hour of the night, a small procession stopped just outside the village. A hiss had sounded from a thicket, and Hugo, returning from a private venture in horse trading to the west of Poncourt, drew rein and half rose in his saddle. Who is there? he said. Step in front of me. Is it you, Hugo? A cautious whisper came. I am glad. I have waited hours for you to return. From the bushes hobbled a hunched figure, wrapped about in a long black cloak. He recognized the wrinkled face as that of the gypsy crone, Clauda, his best friend after Mirko. What is it? he said, startled by her strange look. What has happened? Don't go through the village, Hugo, she replied, clutching the bridle. The people will kill you. They have seen you with the werewolf's daughter, and they will burn you too. Burn me too? His heart almost stopped beating. They have burned her. Not yet, was the grim reply. But in the morning. Quick, Mother Clauda, what have they done? Where is she? In the square, bound to the stake on the scaffold. Hugo, what are you going to do? The last words were almost a scream for the boy had leapt from his horse and torn away her cloak. I'm going to save her, he replied, wrapping the cloak about him and drawing it close about his head. They will kill you, Hugo. Is she worth it? quavered old Clauda, her lips trembling. He turned to her tenderly and placed his arm about her waist. Clauda, you have been a mother to me, and we love each other, do we not? But now my heart lies in Poncourt, and if this girl dies, my life is an empty thing, for she is my worship, and we have sworn an oath together. Take the horses to the camp, and if I never return, they shall be yours. I have plenty of money with me. Give Mirko a farewell, and this for you. He bent and kissed the soft, withered lips. They were wet with tears. Then, gently, he disengaged the arms that clung to keep him with her, and he was away. He ran into the village streets with long strides, making a wide circle to avoid the first row of buildings. Sobbing, Clauda led the horses around the village. With an uncanny prescience, she knew she would never see the boy again. The days ahead would be bleak and dreary without him. And thus it came about that on the third night of the caravan's stay, from opposite sides of Poncourt, came two men, animated with a single purpose. They were pawns in a game that neither could have understood, a game whose beginning was before their known history, and whose end and far-reaching events may not yet be done. Chapter 8 Ivga cried out, and opened her eyes to a blinding glare. A sputtering torch scorched her face and hair as the guard bent over her and shook her shoulder roughly. What are you talking about? He snarled. None of your tricks, vixen. Are you calling up some fiend from hell to serve you, witch? Silence, or I'll slit your tongue. Why don't you answer me? Answer me. To whom were you talking? Why did you say, you may, and yes? when no one spoke to you. Why, witch? With the entering of her body again, Ivka had forgotten the meeting with the master. Now she could only blink into the glare and murmur. Someone is coming at last. Hardly knowing the meaning of the words, for the master had taken back the memory of the meeting as one last mercy. Still holding her by the shoulder, the guard turned about. His face had turned white with fear, for he was prone to superstition and expected to see some bat-winged creature close by, called from its evil nest by the witch. 
A man was standing below at the foot of the steps. His face was not visible, for a fold of his long black cloak hid all but his eyes. They glinted like steel in the brilliant moonlight. The revulsion of feeling was too much for the sentry. Who are you, and what do you want? He queried boldly. A sepulchral voice issued from the black cloak. I am a messenger from hell for you, it said. Your place is prepared. Come. With slow tread, the figure mounted the steps. The sentry backed away as it came higher. Stop, he squeaked in a terrified falsetto. What do you want? The black cloak fell to the ground. As the man sprang up the last two steps, the girl gasped, Hugo, as he flashed her a quick promising glance and advanced toward the guard. I want the girl and your blood, he spat. Death to you, gutter offal. The guard, seeing that it was only a man before him, sprang forward, roaring. Hugo grinned as a wolf grins. As the guard's sword hissed from its scabbard, the primitive rapier glimmered in the boy's hand like a slender pencil of light. The two blades engaged. Back across the platform, the sentry rushed the lighter man in the first shock of conflict. His long weapon whirled wickedly and struck sparks as it clashed against the slim, pointed rod that seemed to be always in the way. Parrying his fiercest strokes, the rapier slanted from side to side, never thrusting or remaining still, but always retreating before the guard's ferocious slashes. Continually, the saber bit nothing but air, being deftly turned aside in mid-stroke before it had reached maximum velocity, and it ever whistled off at a tangent. They reached the platform's edge, and Hugo, watching his opponent's eyes, read in them a sudden, evil glee. Suspecting something uncertain, therefore to be dreaded, he danced abruptly to the left. As he did so, his groping foot found an empty space in place of solid plank. He shot out from the scaffold, falling eight feet to land quite solidly upon the cobblestone pavement of the square. Almost instantly he was up again, but no longer smiling. Had one watched, he would have noticed that his movements lacked the resilience and spring of a moment before. Three slashes he parried mechanically, dazed by the blow. Then, as his brain cleared, he took the offensive. Enough time had been wasted. Through tight-clenched teeth, his breath hissed, like the angry speech of a snake. The rapier point pressed forward, now menacing, and did not give ground. All of the guard's experience up to that time had been with cutting weapons, sabers, axes, broadswords, large and ugly tools for hacking, designed to kill or maim with a single blow. Thrusting weapons were likewise clumsy. Pikes and spears, in a dozen cruel forms and variations. These were the weapons of the time. Small wonder that Ivga had laughed at Hugo's rapier, so small in comparison. But the guard, hard-pressed and fighting for his life against a strange weapon and an unknown method of fighting, would have felt no inclination to jeer could he have spared the time. A blur was before his eyes, and from his cheek, A warm, salty trickle ran into his gasping mouth, where the point of Hugo's weapon had torn in a barely deflected drive for the throat. Midnight is good to die in, menaced the boy. Are you ready, woman beater? This was the first blood drawn during the fight. It had the instant effect of setting the guard wild and reckless so that he rushed into the almost invisible circle of steel. In fifteen seconds, with three cleverly executed strokes, one sidestep and a parry, Hugo pinked his antagonist, neatly, through the fleshy portion of his left shoulder. As the man turned a quarter way round, his arm raised for a blow, the rapier slipped into his right wrist. 
With the double power of the upward thrust and the downward blow, the rapier tore through arm and sleeve as it might through paper, leaving the arm useless. From the guard's nerveless fingers fell the curved sword, slitting the side of Hugo's boot as it clanked upon the stones. This was his only injury in all that strange fight. Quickly reaching with his left hand, the man clutched for the fallen sword. As he lurched forward, the rapier point met him. For an instant, Hugo kept the pose, left hand behind him, right knee bent, right arm and rapier forming a straight line that ended in the guard's chest. As a tree falls, so fell the guard, dragging the rapier from Hugo's hand, leaving the boy staring down at him. Dead. Although he had seen many so, this was his first victory that had ended in death. Suddenly he felt sick in the pit of his stomach. It was so easy to kill a man. On the scaffold, Ivga spoke wearily. Conquering his squeamishness, Hugo tugged at his blade. The flesh clung about it, as though loath to let it go. Before it was free, he was forced to pull at it with all his strength. With a swift stroke, he wiped clean the rapier upon the dead man's coat. Holding the slender rod in one hand, he drew his dagger with the other and leaped up the steps of the scaffold. The dagger made short work of the leather thongs that bound her body to the pillar. With the guard's keys, he released her from the chains. She opened her eyes and smiled at him. It was a pale, wan smile that wrung his heart as he released her from her cruel bonds. I knew you would come, she whispered, and her arms went out to him. As she took a step forward, her limbs gave way beneath her. Paralyzed by the tightness of the straps, she fell to her knees upon the rough planks. Instantly, he was holding her close. Her voice sobbed thickly to him, muffled, for her face was pressed hard against his cheek. Oh, Hugo, I cannot walk. What are we to do? In that moment, feeling her dependence upon him and her implicit trust that somehow he would save her, the boy became a man. A deep love and yearning to protect welled up within him, called by her helplessness, and he replied, We will go at once to the camp. Mirko will hide us. Come. And he stood up. The girl attempted to rise but the pain was too great and she collapsed again. Her wrists were deeply cut by the chains, and, as she chafed her ankles, she could feel no sensation in her hands. You go, she said finally. Leave me here. I will only be a burden to you. The watchman will come through here soon, and we cannot both escape. Flee, Hugo, before the alarm is given, or we both shall die and I don't want you to die too. He grinned. You rave. Did you really believe I would go away from you now? No, if we are killed, we die together. Let us go to Mirko. He sheathed his weapons, lifted her in his arms, and descended the steps. Get the book on the beam, Hugo, said Ivga. It is mine. And, with the book in her arms, Hugo carried her proudly across the deserted square, eerie in the white moon glare, and peopled now only by the few stray dogs that skulked in the shadows. They were lean curs that kept an odd silence and followed close behind. They entered a narrow street and left the square some distance behind before either spoke. Ivga lay quietly in his arms, watching his stern face for some sign of weakness. Although his lips were tightly compressed, his breath came uneven and unhurried as he swung along, covering ground rapidly with the long strides. Am I heavy, Hugo? she asked once. Set me down a little and rest. His answer was to crush her tighter against his chest. You are not heavy at all, little Ivka. I could carry you forever. She clasped her hands around his neck, relieving him of a little of the strain, the book in her lap, 
and kissed him with a swift movement. After that, her brown hair sank down upon his shoulder and the tired eyes closed. Tenderly he bore her, for her cuts and bruises were many. He thought she slept. They entered an alley, which opened off the side street, giving a view of dark treetops against the stars. His aim was to reach the gypsy encampment, if possible, and to place himself and the girl under the protection of the chief. He felt certain that the cowardly villagers would not dare to attack a strong force. Finally, he was compelled to release his burden and rest. While he rubbed his cramped arms, he saw from the tail of his eye a stealthy movement behind the corner of a building. It was as though someone had peered out and darted back. Sword in hand, he ran back. Nothing was in sight, and he returned to the girl. Again he gathered her carefully into his arms and strode off, now often turning to look behind. There was no stir or movement. They had continued for a couple of minutes, and his suspicions were almost lulled when Ivga's head lifted from his shoulder, her curls brushing his cheek. Someone is following us, she whispered, her lips tickling his ear. Without answer, he quickened his pace. A large building was before them. Once around the corner, he laid her down, made his sword ready, and waited. A head poked cautiously around the corner. It saw the waiting blade, jaw dropping in horror and surprise, and was instantly withdrawn. It was the watchman. Hugo leaped in pursuit of the fleeing man, who yelled with every bound, imagining the point was already in his back. The race was short. Hugo rapidly overtook the pursued. There was a brief flash of steel, rapier against dagger, and the cries stopped. But the mischief had been done. Windows began to creak open, and voices to shout from house to house as he ran back to Ivga, hugging the shadows. Quick, he panted, to the gypsies, they will help us. And he stooped to pick her up. No, she exclaimed, it is too far. They would catch us long before we could get there. We will go to the river, find a boat, and drift downstream until we are far away. But we will have to go back through the village to reach the boats, he protested. Come, She tugged impatiently at him. I know a way. If we climb that mountain and go down the other side, the river is just below us. Dimitri, she choked on the word, and I had a little boat that we hid in the rocks. We used to sail it on the river and fish from. Can we go around the mountain? He gasped, doubting her strength for such a climb. No, she replied jerkily. Thick brush on one side. The river is too deep on the other. Can't swim. I can climb. Hurry. Chapter 9 A man bearing a mighty sword had reached the corpse of the watchman. At his back skulked a double shadow, his own and a second beside it. Yet only one man was visible in the moonlight. The man bent over the body and nodded admiringly as he saw the hole. It had been placed, skillfully, beneath the third rib. He passed on, upon weak and tottering limbs, chuckling to himself. It had been a neat death, and he recognized that the cause of it had been the same weapon that laid low the sentry by the scaffold. He had more than a suspicion that he knew who bore the weapon, whose like had never been seen before in Ponkert. He knew also who had cut the bonds of that prisoner the sentry had guarded in the village square. The man hobbled around the corner of the building. A long way off, he saw two people running across the fields toward the mountain. He shouted, but they were too far away to hear. Using gate opener as a crutch, he followed. Beside him, if he had turned his head, he might have seen two shadows slip over the ground. In the village, 
Lights were beginning to show in houses and torches to wave in the streets. The crowd gathered, all confusion and shouting, about the scaffold in the square. They hurried madly about in search of the fugitives, each one looking carefully where he thought the werewolf would least likely be. There was much crowding together. Safety in numbers, the werewolf's daughter is loose. They went that way, and off they would pour in another direction, howling like madmen. Soon, there was a great deal of deserting from the ranks, as the most lukewarm and half-hearted members decided that the night was too chill for delicate lungs, and it would be as well to wait for morning. Consequently, it was twenty minutes before the body of the watchman was discovered, sprawled in a dark alley, and the two who fled had climbed the mountain. Dimitri had just reached its base when lights began to wink and flare across the fields. These lights were not needed for illumination on the moonlit paths, but were brought because it was well known that a werewolf feared artificial light. The road over the mountain was not a fair or level causeway, but a steep declivity. It was crusted with rock and round pebbles until the very top, where it was notched and grooved, pinnacles on either hand, forty feet or more of black rock, clothed in summer by dainty flowers that no hand would ever pluck or nostrils smell. In the bottom of this tremendous groove, two figures lay panting after the tedious struggle up the shifting slope. Stones still clattered down, knocking dryly together in rush and chattering hurry. The excited babble of their going droned up to the two in a murmur of sound, and though the pebbles gathered others with them, becoming a tiny landslide as they poured into the valley, the roar of their final plunge came up to the twin peaks as a faint and airy whisper. So remote were they in their awful majesty from the passions of men. The boy and girl rested. They had climbed the slope and had arrived at steps cut in the solid rock. These steps were carved by hands that were long since dust, to the purpose of making a watchtower for the castle that lay in ruins far away. Up the steps and along a dangerous path hanging over a straight drop of a hundred feet they had passed. At its finish there were more steps around a boulder and then a steep climb over the lip of the cliff, directly above a giddy drop. One false step meant death. I can see now why this is a shortcut, panted the boy. This place was made for goats and children. A sudden noise from far below, a new tinkling of stones set in motion, startled them. Oh, they have found us, cried the girl. They are coming to kill us. Oh, Hugo, save me. I love you. He held her tightly until trust and confidence in his protection and strength reassured her. Finally, he loosed his grip and sprang to the edge of the cliff. Far beneath, a black, indistinct figure moved up the treacherous gravel slope. It was a figure that climbed slowly and stopped often, as though the road was most difficult. As he watched, it progressed higher and nearer. A long way behind, the fields gleamed and twinkled with many flecks of dancing light which drifted toward the mountain like fireflies in an interweaving love dance over a marsh. Still more distant, Ponkert was ablaze with lights. Hugo heard a thin, faded murmur, like distant rapids far off, where, in a mad hubbub and howling rout, the people surged about an immense bonfire in the square. Hugo swore softly to himself and moved back upon the cliff. With both hands, he was struggling with a loose rock to roll down upon the climber, when the girl, who had also looked over the edge, prevented his design. Quick, she whispered fearfully. Let us go to the boat. He is still far away. When he reaches here, we will be gone, 
and he will have no idea where we went. Her logic was indisputable, for a falling stone would have betrayed their presence on the mountain, even if this man were killed. Hugo reluctantly allowed himself to be drawn along the cleft in the mountain without another downward glance. Had either looked again, they could hardly have failed by this time to recognize the massive sword, which swung many times as the climber staggered on the dangerous path. Along its five-foot length, it flamed in the moonlight like the demon-forged sword of Ibn Asad Iraf, which the genii formed from the white ash of thunderbolts. He had passed the gravel slide and was halfway up the mountain when Hugo and the girl commenced the descent of the other side. Here, too, the path was narrow and steep, if less precipitous. But the danger was equal, for there was no moon to light this side. Down slippery steps they stumbled, along crumbling rotten ledges, drowned in shadows. They crashed through the bushes and felt their way about in the dark, all the while tottering precariously on the edge of destruction. From below, it seemed that the river came up to meet them all too slowly. At length the girl could see the little boat rocking by its secret wharf hidden in the reeds. The dampness and chill of the river fog was rising about them when the mob commenced to climb the gravel slide. High above them, on the path below the cliff rim, Dimitri rested, leaning upon the sword, gate opener. The struggle had been hard and long for his feeble limbs, and only the deathly fear of being too late to help his loved one had kept him moving. Burdened by the heavy sword, it seemed a miracle to him that the climb had been accomplished. But the worst was over, only a few steps separated him now from the girl he worshipped. And knowing that once upon the mountain the three could hold off an army, he rejoiced. The torches below mounted higher, restlessly nearer. The shouts of their bearers became clear. Wearily, Dimitri walked toward the steps that led up to the cleft above, almost overbalanced by the great broadsword. Ivga, he called, when he topped the cliff's edge. When there was no answer, he forgot caution and cried loudly, Ivga, Hugo, where are you? It is Dimitri. There was no sound but the whistle of the wind through the mountaintop ravine and the dry whisper of pebbles rattling below, set in motion by many feet. Then, gripping his heart with a chill of foreboding, came the memory of the boat upon the river. He began to run along the bottom of the little gorge. Perhaps he was too late. And looking over the edge of the opposite cliff, he saw them, half lost in the fog that streamed about them and nearly to the river. Realization came that he could not reach them in time to save himself. Should they learn of his presence, he knew they would return to rescue him or die in the process. Consequently, he forbore to speak and watched silently as they dropped lower in the fog, save once when he whispered with lips that trembled, Goodbye, little daughter, goodbye. For a long time he lay watching them as they clambered down the cliff, until his eyes blurred so that he could see them no longer. Angrily he dashed away the tears, denying even to himself that he was sad. I am not sad, he cried to the stars. I am happy, Benric, happy. Can you hear me? Wherever they may go, whatever they may do, it will be I that has made it possible. I promised you, O oh, tragic soul, that I would guard her with my life. Watch me if you can, and see how a Helgar keeps an oath. With my blood I buy her happiness, and she will be happy because of me. I will be happy because she will never know I died to save her. Oh, Benric, I am glad, glad that I am here tonight. Not everyone can die for the one he loves best in all the world. Trailing the immense sword behind him, he ran back. In the center of the pass, 
He chose his position with care, selecting a spot where the two sides of the notch came closest, like the narrow point of the letter M. And of the M, each angle was a pinnacle of rock forty feet in height. There was only one spectator. The shadow that had accompanied Dimitri thus far disengaged itself from his shadow. It rose like a wisp of fog along the cliff until it reached the top of the left-hand pinnacle, where it stopped and became one with the other shadows on the wall. Two spots of light glistened where it paused, like moonlight reflected from moist, shiny eyeballs. In his chosen spot, Dimitri made ready. The floor was not level except where he stood, and sloped in a gentle descent in the direction of the river, more steeply toward the other cliff. It was strewn with rocks that had fallen from the twin pinnacles. These, Dimitri cleared from his platform, casting them in the path up which attackers would soon climb. He could hear them toiling up the loose gravel as he dislodged the last moving stone and rolled it down. The cursing and rattling of stones was very near. A lurid, smoky glare rose over the edge of the cliff, a heavy thump followed by a chorus of jeers and coarse laughter. He ran back to the centre of the pass and waited in a niche in the wall. The murky smoke and glare of the torches shining on the rock were like the sun rising over the lip of the ledge. Then, three bright flames burst into sight together. The old man crouched closer in his niche, where the light would not find him, whispering to his sword, Soon, soon, dost thou hunger, patience but a little longer. While he patted gate opener's hilt and crooned to it, the people were gathering on the ledge. Up they came, breathing hard and sweating from the climb, looking about with curiosity. Although the mountain was near home, many had never climbed since they were children, and the surroundings were strange. Well contented to rest, those foremost waited until all had come before essaying the next climb, when the troop was gathered. Dimitri saw that they numbered perhaps a rough two-score persons. He chuckled to himself, stroking the smooth blade. Only forty, gate opener, only forty. How many will there be after they have played with you, sweet chum? The mass began to move, one hundred feet away, seventy feet, forty-five. Dimitri cast one last look around him, saw that only three could approach him at once in the narrow passage, and took a deep breath. They were thirty feet away when he sprang into the open, his back against a large boulder immovably embedded in the rock. None saw his leap. One second he was not, the next, there he stood, leaning on the great sword, square in the centre of the path, as though he had sprung from the living rock. Then, with the design of halting the mob, he opened his lips. From them pealed forth a strident, inhuman screech, sounding like nothing else in either heaven or earth. It was the guttural, Hi, ye ye, of the Cossack about to join the battle. Cries of fear arose from the crowd as they saw the apparition and stopped. Above them, upon his pinnacle, the master chuckled and settled himself for the show. The curtain had risen, the players were at hand. The first line had been spoken, the play was about to begin. The master promised himself a rare entertainment. He had tested the mettle of Pondkirt men before, and he was well assured that they would not pass until the boy and girl were far down the river. So he hoped. For the girl's escape meant much to him. The report that the maniac's kick had been fatal to Dimitri had been circulated in the village and believed, for it was well known that the cripple had not left his chair for many days. So now they looked at this spectre, arisen from the dead, 
and the superstitious mob surged back in horror. Faces blanched, while pale lips muttered half-forgotten charms for the laying of the restless dead who would not sleep of nights, and twitching fingers crossed hearts with hurried strokes. And Dimitri moved. The thirsty sword swept through thinly complaining air in dazzling circular swoop. Come, he howled, as he swung the sword, the red glare of the torches running along the blade like dripping blood. Come and kiss death. And a man moved, the idiot Tanner, spurred forward by hate. Braver by reason of his hate, he came forward on trembling limbs, with outstretched hand and ingratiating smile. Deceitful and placatory words waited to be uttered in case the thing was a phantom. But behind him, the other hand closed upon the heavy dagger to be used if it was only a man that blocked the way. Dimitri leaned upon his sword and waited. Nearer the tanner came to the spectre, and nearer still, his hoarse, frightened breathing was all that could be heard that and the oars a thump on the river. Fingers seeking, touched, and found solid flesh beneath material cloth. And with a cry, the madman darted out his dagger in swift and cowardly thrust. Slashing down, as the falcon stoops for prey, screamed the thirsty sword. It shore through the profaning arm, and the hand, still clasped about the dagger's hilt, spun into the shadows. Then, with a quick reverse stroke, the old man struck again, so that ten feet of air was the only union between the tanner's head and the soldiers that had borne it. While the body stood upon limply crumpling legs, the imprisoned air within its lungs rushed forth so that the dead man seemed to speak in coughing, liquid grunts. The head rolled, jaw agape in stupid amazement, and stood upon its stub, as though it watched the battle through fast, glazing eyes. For a moment the crowd stood, shocked. Then it surged forward, axes and knives waving high among the wild and frantic torches. On the river, the pursued found the boat fast to the wharf. The river had fallen so low that the shallow water would not float it over the muddy bottom with the weight of two in it. Hugo was forced to jump over the side and push mightily through the reeds, sinking deep into the mud. After some moments of agonized struggle, he felt harder ground beneath his feet. The keel of the boat grated on gravel and finally floated free. It swung sluggishly in the still water near the shore while he climbed in and took the oars. A confused murmur of voices drifted down from above, and the girl turned to listen. They have reached the top, Hugo, she exclaimed. The oars dug deep, and the boat shot forward with the sudden pounce of a cat. The stout oars creaked and bent with the stroke. Hugo clung to the shore beneath the overhanging cliff in dread of falling stones which he knew would follow should they be seen. The skin along his spine crawled, and his scalp prickled with the momentary anticipation of the shouts that would mean they were discovered. He thought of the rumble of falling boulders that would follow the shouts. Even the splash of one dropping from that height would be sufficient to fill the boat, leaving them helpless in the water and exposed to their pursuers. Ivga, mercifully ignorant of their peril, was listening for further sounds. Five more strokes would take them to safety. Three had been taken when suddenly a wild, unearthly screech pealed out from above. The boat was exactly below the notch in the mountaintop. It was Dimitri's wordless yell as he stepped from concealment to face the mob. Something in the tone struck home to Ivga, but believing Dimitri dead, she did not associate the voice with his. Still, it was familiar, and her puzzled brows knit together 
in a vague, indefinable worry. It seemed to her as though she should know who or what screamed. Strange was the voice, and yet somehow not strange. She had put up her hand to attract Hugo's attention. Stop, she commanded in a low voice. Did you hear that noise? What could it have been? Hugo had heard the screech, in spite of his exertions, and recognized it for what it was, the voice of a man. But he read into it a dreadful meaning and suspected that they were seen. Consequently, he had no thought of hesitating there, in that most dangerous spot. Not wishing to alarm the girl, he answered carelessly, "'Twas nothing, a night bird crying, perhaps." And with another fierce stroke, the boat shot into midstream. The rushing current caught them, and the two were swept away. Still, Ivga was vaguely disturbed. She listened long, ready to trap any vagrant sound, but none came. As they were carried away from the mountain, and the lights of Ponkert became more remote, the possibility of hearing the uproar that was soon to take place in the notch disappeared. At last Ivka sank down into the bottom of the boat and lay there while Hugo rowed sturdily. Seeing him there, she was reassured and placed her head in the hollow of her arm to try to sleep. Dimitri's back was firm against the boulder and his left side was partly protected by an outcrop of rock as the man pack closed in upon him. As a result, he was not entirely exposed to the villager's weapons, which began to lick in and out like frozen tongues of flame. Those who had swords, feeling their superiority over the common herd, who were armed by more menial weapons, had taken the front of the battle. Dung forks were present, flails, clubs and pikes, spears and staves of wood waved in the torch smoke, like limbs of a leafless forest. The humble spade was conspicuous, axe and hatchet glittered, and the knives reached out like an old witch's one long fang. It was a motley crew, and motley was the arming of it. But at the fore, swords were slithering and blades hissed, as though in the darkness death sat, wetting his scythe. And the harvest was not long in the reaping, for the time that Dmitri had spent polishing his well-beloved gate opener over and over until it had attained an unbelievable edge had not been wasted. With a heap of bodies, like a windrow on a haying field, a bloody barrier began to rise across the narrow way. The blades kissed, rusty weapons that had long hung in disuse upon the walls of some peasant's hut were wielded by unskillful hands. They were heavy, ancient tools for murder. They circled in clumsy stroke and parry, stroke again, and parry. Third stroke, no parry. And so fell, clean, unblooded, unfleshed, racing their owners to the ground, and other blades took their turn. The path grew slippery, a tiny rivulet of trickling black in the torchlight, it came from gaping throat, from riven chest, from shattered skull, while panting, reckless men struggled up the steep. They slipped in the red ooze, slid and fell on the loose rocks, and stumbled over the bodies of those that had gone on before. On they came, drunk with the reek of blood, to stagger back, wailing for a space through bubbling throats. Through eyes that were slit, and would never see again, they searched for one more glimpse, or felt their way with stumps of arms through the eager throng. Many remained to add their bodies to the rampart of flesh, but a pitiful debris of battle crawled back, every step a separate agony. Dimitri's sword was sharp. Several died not knowing the blow that slew them, slashed into eternity by a cold edge like a breath of wind upon their throats. While their blades shone unsullied by any stain save rust, gate-opener, as it rose and fell, drank deep, bit hard, 
and lusted for the next, swooping hither and thither in hungry search for prey. Men began to cry out that it was no man that opposed them, but a devil. They cried, too, that the sword lived. And Dmitri held the narrow way. A lull came in the fighting, while men moved the wounded from their path, and Dmitri tugged the bodies of the dead into a heap before him. The villagers were clustering together for a rush, when a voice roared out in that place of death, as though a fiend was merry. It was a hideous, ghastly laugh. Again it howled out, and then, wild and exultant, Shen, Shen, shiver Jen, swing the steel, swing again, ride, ride to our play, slay, slay. Dmitri made mock of his enemies in a song of the steppe. Then they were at him again, three together, scrambling doggedly over the heap of bodies, one with a pike and two with clubs. Gate opener swung up, and the pike rattled in two pieces on the rock. Its holder impaled himself upon the sword. Swift disengagement, four, cursing, the others were upon him. A flurry of clubs, dull thuds, a sharp cry, and one was reeling back, his left arm severed at the shoulder. Stupidly he moved, as one who sees the calamity which has befallen, yet cannot believe. The other man lay prone, another body for the barricade. Those of the mob that were left wavered. They drew back, milled together, and tried to renew their courage. While Dmitri was exhausted, he did not allow himself a moment's rest. He was busy fixing the fallen swords and pikes in the barricade, so that the points projected outward to present a thorny hedge of steel points behind which he waited. The boat had travelled a half mile down the stream, propelled by Hugo's strong muscles and the current. Despite her exhaustion, Ivga was unable to rest. She was leaving her home with a stranger, bound for a new land, and, while her life in the village had been a thing of horror, to be best forgotten, it was still her home. It was the only home she had ever known. Dmitri was dead, murdered in his cabin, without being able to lift a finger toward his defence or hers. Trapped like a rabbit in its burrow, he had died, and all that she held dear had died with him, the only father she had ever known. What could become of her now? Hugo's face looked hard in the moonlight, set and stern, lips compressing with each stroke of the oars. Carrying her away, where and to what fate? Perhaps his father, the Lord, would not like a girl that brought only the clothes she stood in. Perhaps Hugo would not love her long. Man's fancy was fickle, so Dmitri had told her, and if he should leave her, what was there then to do but die? These and other thoughts flitted through her mind while she lay there, intently staring at him. At last he became conscious of her fearful gaze and looked down, smiling. How his face changed when he smiled. Little crinkles about the eyes appeared that one would never suspect existed. Suddenly she was positive that he loved her. Are you tired, Ivka? he asked, ever so softly, placing his hand on her forehead. The gentle touch soothed her wild fancies. She nodded with both eyes closed and clasped his hand in both her own. The little hands were hot and fevered, but reassurance and peace flowed into her from Hugo's cool, hard palm. Silently she relaxed and slipped into a sleep of exhaustion. Up the mountain, a young man was pleading with the mob. It was the brother of the slain woodchopper, whose body had been found in the forest. He gesticulated and stamped about the end of the small ravine, and a fanatical light shone in his eyes. Come, he raved at them. Are you men or sheep? We are forty, and he is one. 
Even rats fight when they are in packs. Are you worse than rats? There was a death-like silence of some seconds, broken only by the groans of a faceless man dragging himself down the slope. Suddenly a voice spoke somewhere within the crowd, with a certain pleased surprise, like one who has just discovered a new and amusing fact. Two words only. Were forty. Who said that? cried the fanatic, glaring angrily about. There was no reply. The broken man lurched on, crawling like some eyeless slug toward the cliff edge and the people. They shrank away from him as though he were a leper. An uncanny feeling was fast becoming a conviction that any who had felt the bite of that long sword was accursed. From the sides they shrank away, and from the front, until he struggled through a lane of silent watchers and reached the edge of the cliff. He stopped, sensing vacancy before him, the shattered head swaying blindly to and fro. No one moved to save him. A hoarse, puzzled croak bubbled from his red mask of a face. He heaved forward on his arms, balanced on the edge, toppled and fell. Men breathed again, the strain broken. Shamefacedly, they dodged one another's eyes, each thinking, why didn't I stop him before he fell? Why am I such a coward? The young man seized the presented opportunity. He did that, he shouted, pointing at Dimitri, a dim figure in the pass. Now, once more, the werewolf cowers beyond him. Shall we wait longer? With deep growls of rage and shame they answered him, and the mass surged forward in the last charge. It was a ponderous, irresistible wave of bodies that rolled on to the attack. They reached the barricade, and there were shrieks from those in front who were pinned upon the spikes that projected from it, but there was no turning back. Over the bodies of their writhing comrades climbed the mob, pressing on to present a front of spears and pikes. In vain, Dimitri struck and struck again. The foe was too great. Feeling his strength ebbing fast, the man knew that his hour was upon him. Back he was crowded, as they mounted over the still living bodies that were spiked on the barrier of projecting swords. As he fought, Dimitri recollected the words of the old gypsy and realized that this was the scene she had described in her vision. A red mass of gashes, he staggered back still farther, gate open a swinging like a monstrous sickle in the hands of death. No longer bright and shining, its edge nicked and dulled on the bones of men. A momentary lull in the fighting, the way was clogged with dead, and as they cleared the path, Dimitri, howling an unintelligible battle yell, went berserk. In his turn, he charged. His last wild strokes a mad effort to keep them back from the river ten seconds more. For within his body, something had broken, and he knew the end was near. Gate opener whistled down, and a man collapsed like a slashed sack of meal, eviscerated, his life juices flowing from him. Then, while Dimitri still hacked his road through flesh, his right foot came upon something that rolled and threw him down. Instantly he was up, but too late. Three spears took him, and he fell. With his last failing remnants of sight, he saw that he had stepped upon the tanner's head, and that gate opener lay close by, shattered beyond mending. Both were leaving together, the man and the sword. He smiled wryly again. A dead man shall slay thee, he quoted the gypsy woman, and his eyes closed. Over his body, cursing, pushing, the remainder of the villagers rushed on to the river, but they were too late, for the two were far beyond. Behind them, Dimitri raised himself upon an elbow, gasping faintly with his last breath. Benric, have I not kept my word to you? 
and so died. Far down the river, the little boat raced south, rocking in the rushing current. The youth who guided it began to sing softly, far from the earshot of the village of Ponkert. As the song was finished, and the voice, mellow and young, died away in the distance, the soul of Dmitri Helgar passed from its war-torn body. It drove past the master, perched upon his rock, and began the journey to the place where such souls go. And the master, as he sped upon his way, gave Dmitri that sign of approbation which is given from one valiant spirit to another, for had he not served the master well, of the red wrath and ruin that raged in Ponkert that day, when the soldier of the Black Brigade learned of the glorious fight and sought out those that were left from the battle, taking a strong revenge for their captain, it is not necessary to speak. Carried along on the bosom of the river, the little boat went rocking downstream, while above the sky reddened with morning. In the stern, Hugo trailed an oar for a rudder, no longer rowing and more than half asleep. He nodded over his task, but was not so far gone that he did not know when the girl's little fingers slipped into his hand, lying limp on the seat. He opened one eye, enough to see that hers were closed, and that she slept. Apparently, she was dreaming, for her lips were curved in the loveliest smile he had ever seen upon her face. She looked much like a little child lying there asleep. Her thick curls were in pretty disarray. Carefully, that he might not wake her, he disengaged her fingers from his hand, removed his coat, and spread it over her. Then, one calloused palm held the oar again, and the other stroked a curl that lay conveniently near. At the light touch, she smiled once more, as though her dreams were pleasant. Dimly, happily, she knew that she would never be lonely any more. Chapter 10 So we see them, two wanderers in Arcadia, almost hidden from us now by the intervening years, dropping down the river, each finding joy in the other, perfect mates. It would be a long story to relate the whole of that journey, how from this river they entered another whose name we do not know, but might have been the Drave, the Save, or the Thies, and were carried on. How they went ashore by night and procured food in many manners, sometimes a vegetable garden suffering from their visits, sometimes a hen roost or dairy. For although Hugo had money, it must be saved for ship passage when they reached the sea and they had far indeed to go. There were seven or eight hundred miles of travel upon the Danube alone. They were miles full of natural perils, even more dangerous than the men they encountered, and they were many. A separate tale could be made of their adventures on the river, how they passed by cities in the night, unhindered, by castles that frowned down at them, two midgets in a cockle shell but accosted them not for toll, how river pirates, less lenient, twice attacked them, sweeping out in long, low skiffs from the hidden coves in the river bank. That fight at least deserves a chapter, how they howled out their cry of blood and death as the skiff came near, and evil faces leered at the two in the boat, how the knitting needle knitted well unraveling soul from body, and how another fought beside the girl and boy, so that the attackers dotted the sullen water, and the fishers fed for days. For, invisible to them, a thing brooded over the boat, a creature powerful to aid and protect, and, unknowing they were owned by it, they unconsciously did its bidding. To their enemies it was a horror by night, and a terror by day. Men's brains were so mazed that sword strokes and spear thrusts missed their marks. The master was leaving Ponkert 
and Hungary for a new hunting ground, and woe to any that would hinder his journey or harm those who travelled under his protection. Among the perils, those of the river must be mentioned. Once they passed the Kazan defile and the terrible iron gates, the rest was less hazardous, but all that way was from one danger into another, and they did not dare to travel by land. So along the stream, from old Moldova to Orsova and the iron gates they floated, where the river is enclosed by mountains and rocky banks, and even landing was difficult at that time. Through the rocks, sand banks, and whirlpools they went, sometimes wet all day long from the spray. Often they were sick and weary, but ever they pressed on, each night one day's journey nearer the sea. Once their boat was sunk in the terrible Senka Rapids, a bank of rocks extending almost across the river, most of them visible when the water was low and eleven hundred yards long. Below these they stole another boat and went on. Through the vast swamp of the Danube Delta, they reached the coast of the Black Sea from the Sulina mouth of the river. Here, when the sea rose even a few inches, the banks of the river could be known only by clusters of wretched hovels built on piles and narrow strips of sand. It was a wild, open seaboard, strewn with wrecks, the only guide for mariners to locate the position of the shallows. The people were half-starved, inbred, atavistic creatures, wreckers by nature, and hardly human. Here the two were afraid and did not linger. Where now is a first-class port, with a town of several thousand, lighthouses, and floating elevators, it was only by chance that they obtained passage by ship. At Constantinople, they shipped again for the last time. Most of their money was gone, and it was more for pity than for gain that a captain agreed to carry the wanderers to France. And so they reached the sea and ships, and from the sea they came at last to Blois. If you've enjoyed this content, consider supporting the Eldritch Archives to grow and make more content. Become a supporter on Patreon, buy an audiobook on Bandcamp, or like, comment on, or share one of the videos on YouTube. And as always, thank you for listening.